back from lunch. And our first talk of the afternoon session is by Samir Matur, who is going to tell us about universality in black hole thermodynamics. OK, it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, to be at this wonderful conference. I would like to tell you a little bit about something I did with my student Madhur Mehta recently. And there's the archive number. So here's an outline of the talk. I'll first start with some general comments on what we expect fuzzballs to be like for generic non-BPS fuzzballs like for the Schwarzschild black hole. So we're not actually maybe making all of them yet except for the work of Bayer and Heidemann and many other people here have really been making neutral fuzzballs. But in the end, when we get the generic neutral fuzzball, at least we should have some expectation of what it should look like. And let's talk about that issue today. So the idea is, the first thing I'll mention is that if you ask about nature of fuzzballs in string theory, let's say for a Schwarzschild black hole of radius 2 GM, then we'll have an entropic argument which will say that the generic fuzzball should be just a little bit bigger than the horizon. If it is smaller than the horizon, it will have to collapse. I mean, that's just because the light cones inside the horizon point inwards and you can't support anything. But in principle, you could have said it would be much bigger. It could be 4M. And I will try to argue, no, the generic guy should be very close to 2M plus a little bit. And with that, we'll come to the real central question of, uh, of the talk. Whenever I have discussed, for example, this issue with Maldacino, look, you had the problem with the information puzzle because black holes had a horizon. We are trying to make the actual states of the black hole in string theory. They don't have a horizon. They are like a planet. Problem is over. What are you worrying about? And the one thing he always tells me is, OK, so you have made these fuzzballs. But why should they have the properties we expect from black holes? If they are just like planets, why can't they have an arbitrary entropy, uh, an arbitrary radiation rate? All those numbers which we have come to know and love, they actually all come by using a horizon. So he would like the horizon. Now, of course, if you have a horizon, you're going to get back into the information puzzle. So what's the answer to that? If the fuzzball theory has shown that you don't get a horizon, then can we reproduce all the other properties of black hole thermodynamics that we sort of believe in, like the entropy, the temperature, and the radiation rates? And so what we'll argue is the following, that even if you have a fuzzball, and the fuzzball is very compact, it doesn't have to be planck length, it could be a little bit bigger than that, but parametrically close to 2 GM. In that case, any compact, extremely compact object will have to have the same properties as the traditional black holes. So if the size of the object, how far out of the horizon radius it is, suppose I call that S, you can see S is like order Planck length, but then it could be multiplied by something. But it's still, it's not like it's 3, 2M or something. It's not like it's 3M or something. It's L times, LP times something so it's overall parametrically close to the, uh, to the surface of this, to the horizon radius. Any object which is smaller than this will have to have the same temperature, the same entropy, and the same radiation rates. Uh, as the traditional black hole with horizon. So you don't need a horizon to get those three numbers. Okay. In the end, I'll come back and talk a little bit about the information paradox and where we are with that. Just compare with how the fuzzballs give you a resolution of the puzzle with what how other uh, approaches to the information puzzle uh, might be thinking about this. OK, so black holes have a very well-defined thermodynamic behavior. And you know this, the entropy is A by 4G. Temperature is 1 over 8 pi gm. And the emission rate, when it's given by this Boltzmann factor, and then there's a phase space. But then this number which comes in here is actually equal to the probability of absorption. So if we have a spherical wave, let's say for a scalar field, which is incoming in the spherical harmonic y ln, and then if you have a at frequency omega, then suppose p is the probability that actually gets absorbed by the black hole, then thermal behavior just means that the absorptions and emissions are related by detailed balance. And this is basically what Hawking found, that it is, when you say a black hole emits thermally, this is what you really mean, that the emission rate is, is related to the absorption property by just the normal Boltzmann factor and phase space rates. OK, so these are the properties of the black hole that we have come to know and love. And as you can see, we use the horizon as an argument to get to this. For example, when Beckerstein argued that black holes should have an entropy given by the area, he said, if I throw some gas into the black hole, then the area increase a little bit. To say the second law of thermodynamics, look, I decrease some entropy, then the area should increase. And if the area increased by, if the entropy increased by proportion delta S over G, or delta A over G, 
then you can sort of save the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, so that's the argument. Now, he wouldn't make that argument if the black hole was a normal object like a garbage can. You, you throw a piece of something into the garbage can, and you can't see it, but uh, because the can is closed, but it's in there. So you don't make the argument for that. But somehow, because the black hole has a horizon, and inside the horizon, we really can't see because the structure of light cones, then one tries to say, OK, if you throw this in, it's gone. And so how do we save it? So then we try to save it by increasing the area, and we come up to this. So somehow, horizons seem to be important to that argument. And the same thing happens for Hawking radiation, because if this is where I draw the horizon, uh, and this is the, uh, the radial coordinate, r equals 0, singularity is somewhere here. This is r equals 2m. As r going to infinity, you can think of this as Eddington Victor style coordinates. Then the light goes outside, point like normally. And if you want to go out, you can go out. You can see you can go out. At the horizon, you can at best stay there or fall in. And inside, you, you have to go in. So if you look at light rays, the ones out, which are outgoing, the ones outside sort of ultimately peel up, peel off and go over there, while the ones inside ultimately peel off from the horizon and fall inside. And that's what causes Fourier modes at the horizon to stretch. And that stretching, as we well know, takes the vacuum state here to something which is populated by pairs of particles uh, when you stretch the mode. So that's the standard calculation of Hawking. And uh, that's where the Hawking radiation comes from. So you can see that he clearly uses the uh, horizon for this. So it might seem that you need the horizon to get the behavior of Hawking radiation. OK, so something is not showing up on this slide. Uh, OK, so I, I don't know what, what something got cut off maybe when I converted to PDF. Uh, I hope it will work on the other slide. So anyway, the problem with all this picture of Hawking, of course, is that you get these entangled pairs, these two particles. But then as you keep producing every entangled pair, the entangled between the outside and the inside as a function of the number of particles you have produced, it keeps rising. And so the entanglement graph just keeps going up and up. OK, so that's the, that's the problem. And so if you have a horizon, you actually have a problem. And you have to find a way of getting out of it. So we know in string theory what we do to get out of it. You make a black hole out of the various objects in the theory, which are strings and brains. You compactify some dimensions. For this tra traditional D1, D5P black hole, you could wrap some strings on the S1, some D5 brains on T4 cross S1, put some momentum modes uh, in along the S1, and a bound set of these actually gives the black hole. And so Strominger and Wafa, and before that, Ashok Sen for the two-child black hole, compute the microscopic entropy of these at weak coupling. And that turned out to be exactly equal to the surface area of the traditional picture of the black hole that we would get at strong coupling, presumably. But if you have this picture of the black hole, which, which we have up here, then as we have seen, that leads to the information paradox. So the question is, if this is the weak coupling picture of some brains that you can see at strong coupling, is that indeed the correct picture, or do you get something else? And the entire game of the fuzzball program, which so many people have contributed to, I've tried to put some of the names down here, but they are many, many more. Uh, it turns out every time you try to make a bound state of brains, you don't end up finding all the brains going to the center. In fact, they puff up and make some object, which is always outside the horizon. In fact, the horizon never forms. So in 20 years of doing this game and making all kinds of states, nobody has ever found anything which was actually inside the horizon. So it would seem that string theory knows how to solve the problem for itself. It just tells you that no bound state can actually create a horizon. And then everything radiates from a surface like a normal body. And so there is, there is no paradox. And in string theory, the theory is clever enough to evade the puzzle. Okay. So now a generic first ball is expected to be a very stringy object. It has no horizon, no singularity, just some kind of quantum gravity mess. But the important thing is its radius is outside the horizon. And as I said here, it's supposed we expect to be only a short distance outside the horizon. So where does that argument come from? Why can't I, if I had to solve the puzzle by saying thing like a planet, that planet can't be smaller than 2m because then it'll have to squeeze and keep falling in by the structure of light cones. Anything inside the horizon always gets squished to zero. But why can't it be 3m? And it's sort of an entropic argument that we made in, in this paper uh, out here. That the first of all would have to be in one of these extremely compact objects. And we're just going to give the argument for that to start with. I'll recollect the argument from that old paper. And then we'll argue that any extremely compact object has to have the same thermodynamics to leading order as the black hole. That's what I was saying uh, on the introduction slide. And so it will have all these same thermodynamic properties. So let's begin with the question, why should the first ball be an extremely compact object? OK, so I have some problem. Things have not shown up on my slide. Uh, can I use my keynote? Because I have my. I have my, this is not my computer, but I have my computer here. 
somehow it didn't get converted to PDF. Uh, it doesn't happen sometimes. Uh, doesn't mean this one has been on. Uh, I don't know whether this one has been on. Why can't he just share the Zoom? Oh, he can also come in the Zoom, yes. You can join the Zoom. Yeah. Yes. Can you do it for me? Because I don't know what the link is and so on. I send it to the whole conference. Just yeah. So I'll just connect you to. Uh, are you on uh, Edurom or some sort? So. Yeah, I'm on Edurom. So. Okay. Just, uh... Just accept that. Yeah. Visit. Yeah. Visit, yeah, visit website. <coughs> yeah, can you do that? Let me see if the other slides are working or if anything is working here. Sorry? Let me see how many slides are working. If it's just a trouble with some, it's okay. If enough slides are working, I can just keep going. Half the slides are broken. No, I don't no, understand no, no. that. Is Why is that? Are you going to get a permission? Uh, no, 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 no. To get in, you need to be the password. Where is your Zoom? I know, I know, I know, I know. But uh, it's just somehow it's computer that doesn't start the Zoom. We don't join computer audio at all because you know we'll get audio okay. from the other place. Uh, computer audio. Uh, live stream, yes. So now you where is your keynote? Keynote is down here. Keynote is there. Okay. So and now that's the file. here and I will make you share close to that. Oh, that's okay. The, the full screen, right? Or <coughs> keynote palace. So, Joseph, I also sent you the PDF yesterday. Can I send you the keynote by email? Oh, same, but it doesn't matter, it's the same problem. Oh, there's a keynote here. You have a stick? Pardon? Can you put a keynote on a stick? So what do you want me to do? Put it on a stick, the keynote. Does it fit? No, no, it doesn't fit. Does, Does anybody have a dongle? There is, a, if, if it's on the, if you look at the uh, uh, internet connection, there should be a, uh, there's a dongle for the, that one, yes. Yes. It should be on the other side. Here. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, if I get out of the internet, it will die. Just a second. It's me. It's on the dongle. I'm not okay. So what do you need? And USB-C to be, there we go, that looks like the dongle you need. Yes. Right. So put the top on the stick. How many PhDs did it take then? Yep. Right. Okay, can you put this on the stick? Top. Where is the stick? Have to find the stick here. Oh. Down. Oh, yeah. There. This one. That one. Yep. Yeah. Double click. click. Open and then that. Drag it. Let me find a window. Just find my talk. Uh, 
find. <coughs> This is the keynote. This is the keynote. Yeah, this is keynote. I think that's keynote. Yeah. yeah. But put it on the stick, so now it wants. So just drag it to there. Yeah. That's it. Hopefully, Hopefully yeah, I, think, I think I normally just drag it to this window. Okay. Well, you gotta put it into the window. No, it's okay. Just one second. It's okay. Perfect. Because yeah. this is the keynote. this is the keynote. That was the PDF. Oh. Oh, that was this, keynote. this is the keynote. That's the keynote. All right. This is the keynote. Let's go to the stick. Is it a or a stick? I don't know. This is... Where's your Where's your talk? Is it here? Paris, where is it? Twenty-three keynote. Is that it? Ah. On a un problème, le PDF ne marche pas, donc je ne sais pas si on essaie de mettre les keynote sur l'audio. I think this is the doc. Sur le PDF, il y a des formats qui manquent. Il y a des formats qui manquent dans le PDF. Le keynote ne marche pas. Non. Donc qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire Est-ce qu'on peut Est-ce que peut donner ça Replace. Oui, 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 But this was not connecting to the screen. Yes, we see on Zoom. I see on Zoom. I see it's funny display. You want? It's okay. You can leave it like that. Why not? Because you want to. Yes. Can you share the full screen? So now I share in the keynote. If I share the full screen, it should work. Just. Just to share. Just to share. Just to share. Just to share. Ah, Zoom. It's working now. Share screen. And the whole desktop. Desktop one. It's not going to share. So now we go to here. This is the keynote. And we go here. Now we go to the desktop. No, no, no. This will be two. This will be two. I don't know what you're sharing. Yeah, yeah. This will be two. We just need to switch. Share screen. This will be two. Okay. How about the one? Okay. Okay. Now we can see the presentation. Now we see that. No, that's the next one. Is that correct? Oh, that's. Is that right? It's perfect as well. Okay. Uh, no, uh, no, it's okay. This will not work. Oh, yeah, okay. That's okay. The microphone on this. As long as it move works here, that's fine. Okay. I have to back up to where I was. Yeah, he's just backing up. Yeah, I'm just backing up to where we were. This is a different keynote. I couldn't. This is not this one I wanted. Oh. It's a different slide. I think you put in the other some other stock here. Yeah. But, but I'm on keynote, right? I can find my talk, right? You can find your talk, yes. File, open recent. Paris 23 cyclic. This is the talk. How do I get this one to work? No, go play. Go play. Now it's working? Thank you. It's working. Perfect. Okay. Yes. Okay. Really apologize for that problem, but uh, this is where I was. So we were just saying that if you have an entangled uh, set of pairs, 
then you get an increasing entanglement and you get into the Hawking problem. So the problem is we seem to want the horizon to get black hole thermodynamics, but if you have a horizon, then you're going to get entanglement. So what are we going to do? And so in black holes, when we are uh, in string theory, you actually find instead that you get fuzz balls and then you don't actually have a problem. So then let me just get back to where we were. We were actually here and we are going to now try to argue that the object, a general uh, fuzz ball should be actually rather close to the horizon scale, just 2m plus maybe order of Planck length. And this really had nothing to do with fuzz balls, just any theory in which if you manage to make some objects that actually look like you know, or planets or something, such kind of an argument is very general. Suppose each elementary structure that you make on the surface of this is Planck sized. Like suppose you make, like in fuzz balls, you make a closed set line monopole or anti-monopole. The compact circles, let's say, are all Planck length. Then the size of each elementary object or bubble would be order Planck mass. There you can see I've written order Planck mass. And you can assume everything has, let's say, two spin states. So it's a closed set line monopole or anti-monopole. So it carries about one bit of entropy. So then the total Bekeshton entropy would be A over 4G, and it is M over M Planck square. So that's standard. If you have Planck size tiling of the horizon, you know you get the correct entropy. But then you see what's the total mass there? Since you had this many objects, uh, M over M Planck square objects, each of Planck mass, the total mass seems to be order M squared, which is much more than the mass you had, which was order M. So how are we ever going to make any microscopic model actually produce the entropy and also reproduce the mass of the black hole? Well, actually the answer is, is sort of elementary because even though this seems to be the total mass, the actual redshift factor has to be taken into account. If you put something close to the horizon, then the mass as seen from infinity of that objects, it's actually redshifted down by a factor of this, if you are Planck length from the horizon. So it depends on the distance you are from the horizon, but at that distance, you'd have to put that factor. And once you put that factor in, you'll see the mass is actually M. So very roughly speaking, this is how I would intuitively think that a compact object should behave in string theory in any microscopic model. If the elementary objects have like a Planck mass st uh, structure, then uh, you have to tie up the whole horizon with it. You have to put them a Planck length outside. If you put them too far outside, you wouldn't get much redshift and you just can't do it. You can't get the entropy. So the same thing works in all dimensions. I won't take you through the analysis, but you can do it for general dimensions. You get exactly the same answer. But again, if you put Planck length out from the horizon uh, in any dimension, you always get the correct entropy, a correct order of entropy, and otherwise you won't get it. So the lesson from this would be, uh, you know, some first of all special ones you make might be, you know, you start by making things with, let's say, four monopoles and anti-monopoles, some very simple kind of construction. But by the time you get to a generic one, uh, to get the most of the entropy, you'll have to really think, take things which cluster very close to the horizon. Okay, so that was the argument as to why the first balls should be something which is uh, rather compact. Okay. So now let's try to make a precise definition of what's an extremely compact object, because what we really want to prove is that any object whose size is 2m plus just a little bit will actually have to have the same entropy, the same temperature, and the same radiation rate as a black hole. And at first, it might look very really funny, because after all, if I give you, you know, a glass of water, uh, you can make it of any temperature. Here's a glass, the same size, but you could put it at t equal to zero, or at large temperature. There's no connection between the object size and the temperature. But what we are saying here is that black hole thermodynamics is universal. Once you make something which is extremely compact, even if it doesn't have a horizon, it picks up the same thermodynamic properties. And so we want to see how that actually going to come about. Yes. So there is a question about so we need to prevent these objects from falling into, inside the black hole because they're within the Buchdahl radius. Absolutely, they are. And the reason you don't, uh, you bypass the Bukdal bound and all the other no hair kind of arguments, a lot of those you can see in the paper of uh, Gary Gibbons and, and Nick here. Uh, the, there are various things which happen in string theory which allow you to beat the Bukdal bound. And one of which is that if you have a compact dimension which pinches off, okay? So the topology of the compact dimension just changes. Then in fact, you can actually write down all the pressures from there and see that you, you, get, you beat the Bukdal bound trivially. So, so you're, you yeah. rely on string theory and- uh, Oh, absolutely. So, so that's the whole point, that in string theory, how when you look at the first ball constructions, you can see how they beat all of the no hair arguments, and this is one of them. Okay, so let's be precise about how we think about this extremely compact object, because now we know what we are going to prove. And so it will have some core quantum gravity region inside, which is so messy that we don't want to say anything about it. That's the one I have drawn in dark brown. And then somewhere outside, let's just draw a little line, a few plank lines outside that, so that now 
here the quantum object has ended and outside that is some kind of a is semi classical physics okay so that's the rough intuition that there will be some quantum gravity region which is the extremely compact object and out outside that semi classical physics of the kind that we are used to or what we call effective field theory will 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 hold in whatever i have drawn here in yellow okay so now uh, let's see what we require from this object we put three conditions on it the mass from infinity is m okay that defines the mass of the eco second semi classical physics is a good approximation to the dynamics outside our eco so if i call it the radius of the eco outside this it is semi classical physics so i that's also part of definition that is extremely compact the quantum gravity is confined here and outside is normal physics and then the third condition you want the redshift at this region at the surface where the eco ends uh, to be high otherwise not a compact object that's what's telling you it's a compact object if the object is very fluffy you never get a big redshift like in the sun you never get a big redshift but suppose your redshift goes up to 1000 or 1 million i would say okay that's my extremely compact object so that's how we are characterizing it's extremely compact and if you wanted to be 2m plus l planck suppose that's what you wanted then you could say i want my redshift to go all the way up to this as we we'll see later you don't have to go that high but you know you want to make it high that's what defines this extremely compact so this is the redshift at distances planck lens from the horizon but we can relax that a little bit later on and so given that we can at least say something about it in the region in here we don't understand what to say it's very quantum gravitational but outside here for example uh, we can write this is semi classical physics spherically symmetric i'm assuming and so there out here i can write the standard metric that you get for a star uh, that you would write in uh, let's say from the textbook of weinberg and then you know when you solve this the coefficient of dr square comes out to be like this where m of r is the mass enclosed inside some region r and normally you get the m of r by integrating from 0 to r this particular quantity the density but because inside this brown region it's so quantum gravitational we don't think we know that space makes any sense i'll just do it a little bit differently the mass of infinity is m and i can just subtract for up to any radius the mass in the semi classical region okay so there i know exactly what to do so the m of r is defined only for this region and this is the expression and in here i'm not trying to say anything okay so given this we can now start looking at the entropy the radiation and the temperature okay so now we have defined what our extremely compact object is and let's see what we can learn okay so let's first talk about the entropy now this is rather straightforward given what i am going to assume for the moment and then we'll prove the assumption later suppose you have a thermodynamic object that has the same temperature as the black hole that temperature of as a function of energy is the same as the hawking temperature as a function of energy which was given by 1 over 8 pi gm if the temperature was the same for all the temperature function was the same then of course you can just get the entropy from there de over t the temperature of the hawking thing is this so now the eco also has this temperature you integrate that you get s equal to this and you get the bekenstein answer this is a triviality this is actually how the Be uh, bekenstein entropy was obtained the bekenstein only gave an approximate thing with s proportional to a by 4m but how do we actually get the correct entropy once hawking found the temperature was 1 over 8 pi gm he did exactly this and then out comes the entropy okay so you don't need to be black hole extremely compact object or anything this is just thermodynamics so it's not a deep statement we are simply saying that if the temperature functions were equal then the uh, entropy would work out okay this is the most trivial of all the statements i'm going to make but just to keep the entropy aside for the moment well, let's talk about radiation yeah constant so they can always be sub leading things right because if this temperature is not exactly that temperature or mm -hmm. or oh, oh, you mean because only the derivatives are yes yes yeah so i'm assuming that at zero mass there is no entropy when there's no black hole there is so hawking also used that right when the mass goes to zero you put s equal to zero i'm putting in the same assumption so you get the same same assumption same answer okay what about radiation from an eco now normally even if you have the temperature the same for two objects the radiation is not the same for example if you have a small body and a large body you know and how much you radiate from it depends on what the body is made of and you know how big it is and everything but we'll see there's something very universal once you get to something which is an extremely compact object so let's ask where the hawking radiation comes from this is a little bit confusing at first because as we saw in hawking's uh, own derivation it seemed that we were using light rays going on two sides we sort of needed the horizon there's also these other derivation of uh, hartle and hawking where you try to use uh, which i think emir was also generalizing in his talk where you take something from inside and have a tunnel outside so it seems you really need the inside of the horizon to in that method to see what's going out here now then is method not wrong but on the other hand the physical picture it suggests is actually uh, misleading because 
by causality, what is happening in here cannot really tell you what radiation is coming out here. I'll show you in a, in a later slide that the actual Hawking radiation is only generated by modes that are just outside the horizon and they fill up and they actually go to infinity. So if some magical genie came and exploded a bomb in here, it actually cannot change what is happening to the Hawking radiation just outside. So for example, if I did something to change the physics over here, so whatever excitations I thought would tunnel out, I have altered them. It would seem if I was getting, going to get the answer this way, that it would change the answer. But as we'll see in a minute, it actually won't because what's really happening is not that the calculation is wrong. I just said that we have to understand what it's doing. The actual calculation only uses the outside of the horizon, but because you can analytically continue this Rindler patch to the entire metric, you can actually use the metric with only the vacuum here because that's the analytic continuation of the Rindler patch. And then you can derive anything you want by analytic continuation. Okay? So it's not that physically something from inside is coming out. It's just that whatever you're trying to do outside can be analytically obtained by using this part of the action. So where is the radiation actually coming from? So this was the actual Hawking calculation. The like null geodesics out here go out, they feel out like this, these guys fall in, and then these modes stretch, and the modes stretching over this part, they are the one that become the quanta which are going out. So it's really coming from the geodesics that are going out. But really, after some time, you'll need to get more and more geodesics closer and closer to this guy. So really, if you don't have a horizon, you can start wondering where all the geodesics will come from. It still seems that you need a horizon. So what we'll do now is we'll do a re-derivation of Hawking's radiation rate in a simple way, which doesn't use the inside of the horizon. Okay, let's see how we can do it in a way which uses only the outside, and then we can actually transfer it to the ECO. So let's see how we can derive the Hawking radiation rate for a black hole while only using the geometry outside the horizon. So normally the picture would be that in a black hole, this region is just empty space. It's like the Minkowski vacuum. And so there, if you can just take it like Minkowski space time, it's like locally the Minkowski space time, you can think of as locally the Minkowski vacuum. And so if that's Minkowski space time, then uh, this is uh, the picture you can use, and then you can break up that local region into Rindler patches. So if you, in this Minkowski region, if you're outside the horizon, you can actually uh, write Rindler coordinates there. You can call S, which is the proper distance from the horizon, and define it this way from R, and just rescale time in this fashion, and then the metric near the horizon, as you well know, actually the Schwarzschild metric becomes like this, and that's the Rindler metric in the region close to the horizon. Okay, so then you can write the Rindler vacuum. Maybe that, uh, you should change the, the letter. Yes, in, on the left. We plot this. In on the right. You are absolutely right. <laughs> this S is not no, this. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. This is not this <laughs> S. Yes. Okay. Good. So. Now, the important point is the Minkowski vacuum, which is the actual state we have at the horizon, that's the UNRU vacuum, it's the smooth vacuum, it's the local Minkowski vacuum. You can always write as a Rindler vacuum plus Rindler excitation. So we also know that the Rindler vacuum is not the Minkowski vacuum, but Rindler vacuum plus some excitations, uh, which are properly entangled across this center point, give you the uh, Minkowski vacuum. So let's go ahead and do that. So then you can actually see that the Rindler vacuum has a certain temperature here, and as you come closer to the horizon, the, the temperature gets higher and higher. That's just a property of Rindler space. And let's just write down what the temperature is. And the Rindler temperature is 2 pi over s, where s is the proper distance from the horizon. And what essentially happens is that in this region, if you are in the Schwarzschild frame, which is a Rindler frame close to the horizon, you will see a very hot bath of Rindler excitations. They will, they will try to head out from there. And then as they head out, because they are climbing out of the gravitational field of this uh, of the black hole, they will get uh, redshifted. And so they'll reach infinity with the temperature of Hawking radiation. And these numbers all agree that if you take the Hawking radiation temperature at infinity, you apply the blue shift factor up to some distance s, then you actually find the local uh, Rindler temperature. So this is t infinity multiplied by the blue shift factor, put the t, t Hawking uh, as a temperature at infinity, put in the GTT, and there you get the Rindler temperature. So just to give you the usual picture, it's just you can think of the Rindler mode just outside the horizon. Uh, they go out of this uh, region and they become Hawking radiation. So just we try to rederive Hawking's answer now that we know that uh, that answer is there. So let's do it all for a master scalar field, box phi equals zero. And so the way you would do it, you would expand in Schwarzschild coordinates. You can make some angular piece YLM. You can put the frequencies to the minus I omega T, and you need to solve for some radial functions. And then this is the wave function, the positive frequency wave function. You multiply it with some annihilation operator, conjugate with the creation operator, and then the Minkowski vacuum would be the Rindler vacuum, plus stuff. I'm being schematic here because you have to also entangle the other side. But if you just want to worry about the side you're looking at, the Minkowski vacuum as seen locally would be not the Rindler vacuum, but Rindler vacuum plus excitations. 
Okay, so then we can see what the uh, these particles are doing as they're trying to head out. What's really happening is that actually a, they have to tunnel through a strong potential barrier. So this is the really the region where it looks like a thermal bath. You know, thermal bath particles are going every which way. So they are going forward and they are going backwards. So why are they going backwards? Because there's a potential well outside that they need to tunnel through. What potential well is that? We are supposed to solve the equation box phi equals zero to get the modes to put in the field quantization. You can then solve this phi classically by putting it as chi over r, and then chi satisfies this differential equation with an effective potential, all very standard physics. And then this effective potential is what I have tried to sketch here. So what's trying to happen is these render quanta here, which are at this particular temperature, some, part, some of them manage to leak through this, and the ones that leak through this and get appropriately redshifted, they become the Hawking radiation. So that's, you do this, you'll get an exact derivation. Was there a question? Here, yes, there should be the spherical YLM of theta phi, which is the idea. Thank you. So, okay. the, so the, the usual story, like if I'm, um, you know, assuming that I have vacuum near the horizon, um, I start with the Minkowski vacuum, local inertial vacuum, then I decompose it in these modes. Yes. So there's some implicit assumption about some boundary condition yes. that's being placed at the horizon, which has this high degree of entanglement across yes. the horizon. Yes. So exactly. where is that in your picture? So I just didn't write it because I didn't need it for the moment, but it was supposed to be at this step, right? This is not really correct, right? OM, Minkowski space has two yep. sides to the diagram. Mm -hmm. You have to write Rindler right and Rindler left. So ideally we would like to replace that with um, Rindler left being replaced by fuzzball. I'm gonna do something like that in a minute. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna do exactly that. So the point is that the left guys are just entangled with the right guys, but exactly how you entangle doesn't matter because the guys on the other side are not going to come out. It's only the guys on this side which are going to leak out. So exactly how I entangle them doesn't matter. So, so okay, so this is just how I wrote the thing down. And then if I solve that equation, now you can see the entire calculation here. I could do the, if I had to like, maybe suppose you have to give a lecture on derive me the Hawking radiation. This is all you really have to do. You say, here's a regular bath containing these quanta at this temperature. Here's the potential that we know. And because tunneling through a barrier is symmetrical, the property going one way is equal to property going the other way. If this is the property of a quantum going in, and this is the occupation number of these guys in every mode, which is over here, this is the phase space factor. And just a you know, couple of minutes calculation on the board shows you this is actually going to be the emission rate. So in fact, you can calculate Hawking's emission rate. You don't have to go back to the old calculation of Hawking where he took the you know, crucial coordinates and followed geodesic splitting on both sides and tried to see what you get. You can do it just in the Schwarzschild coordinates outside once we have the hindsight of understanding that you know how the Unruh vacuum works and so on and how all the temperatures are connected. You can just get the answer directly from here. But given this, you can now see how it will work the same for an ECO. So suppose you replace the horizon by some object here, which is let's say a plank length outside. So you just got a hot surface. And for the moment I'm assuming that this object has the same temperature as the black hole. Well, then it, it populates this region just outside it with the same temperature. It has the same potential barrier because outside a few Planck lengths, the same metric here, and at infinity, it'll then show up in the same way. And then you find that because you have exactly the same setup as before, uh, you're going to actually going to end up with the same radiation rate. So what's key over here? It's a very elementary statement we are making. It's not a very deep statement. The only key is that if you start off with, if you have a lot of blue shift, which is what you get for an extremely compact object, then the physics of these guys, the local thermal physics of these, decouples from the physics of penetration through the barrier, because the barrier is the overall scale of a few m, right, few gm. So that's three kilometer barrier. This is something very small. You can think of this as, you know, maybe a thousand Planck lengths here. So that's where the high energy radiation is. So this becomes universal. The barrier is the same. And then you actually end up getting the same answer. So again, the most crucial point here was I've been assuming that the temperature of this object is the same as the temperature of the black hole. I haven't proved that. That's the most important thing. And I have to come and prove that for you. But if I, if I assume the temperature is the same, then for obvious reason, the entropy would be the same. That's not a deep statement. But also for the if I assume that the, the, the whole thing has a region of high redshift for the entropy, I didn't even need to use that. But if I have, if the ECO is compact, so the redshift here is high, then the barrier is the same and you actually get the same radiation. If it wasn't an ECO, this surface could be here. <laughs> then even if it was the same temperature, the amount of barrier would be different that you have to penetrate through. And then the answer indeed would be different. Right? So if you have a normal object, then it doesn't have the same radiation rate. But if you're in a high redshift region, it doesn't matter exactly where you put this, you'll get the same radiation rate. Yeah. I was confused about uh, something about the temperature. So when I mean, I gravitational potential, I have various temperatures and various uh, 
yes. So this TS, you know, it, it appears to depend crucially if I'm very close to the horizon, I get some temperature, yes. then as I get out, it, it's a different temperature. Yes. And then I agree to infinity, you get the Hawking temperature, but the TS should be varying when you go from the fastball surface. Yes, it even is. So S is the distance from the surface and the temperature is indeed varying like this. That's the variation. And, this, and, and, and the surface is the horizon normally and otherwise... Yeah, it's normally in the previous picture, it was the horizon. And the ECO was just supposed to be a Planck length outside the horizon. So this is the ECO. This is the one Planck length outside the horizon. If you and like. this one over S behavior is a four dimensional pure property. When you go to five dimensions, it's still one over S or does it change one over S squared or something? Uh, I think the temperature is always one over S. The other factors may change. The, the render temperature is always one over the proper distance in all dimensions. Mm -hmm. But the temperature at infinity is always one over the Schwarzschild radius order of. Mm -hmm. The Schwarzschild radius is not always GM. Mm -hmm. Of course. It, it is GM right. to some other power. Of course. Thanks. Yeah, we actually have done this for all dimensions, but I'm presenting it only for three plus one because it's easier to see everything. Okay, so the real crucial question is the temperature because you know, if the temperatures agree, we have just seen the other two things are going to agree, but why should the temperature be the same? And this is the question that Juan would always ask you when I meet him and talk about fuzz balls. Why can't you take a fuzz ball and put it at zero temperature? Just cool it. And if you have a zero temperature object, uh, then you know it doesn't have the Hawking temperature. And now I have no connection between this and the black hole. And everybody agrees they want the black hole temperature, so how is that going to come? Okay, so for that, the crucial thing is we need to compute the energy density for the scalar field around the horizon. So the scalar field that we have out here, it has some, some energy density that we can compute. This is all the work in quantum fields and curved space that people did in the old days of actually normalizing the stress energy tensor of the electromagnetic field, and then they can find the, the value of the energy. And the important part of the energy density is that even if you're at zero temperature, if you come close to the surface of a black hole, there's actually a Casimir energy. So the calculation was set up by Christensen and Fulling and some other people. It was finally done for this particular case by Candelus. And I'll just give you the answer. And that's going to be crucial for us. So again, let's remind ourselves, you have a local smooth vacuum here, and this was a Rindler wedge, and we had all these temperatures. But if you look at the, this region here, suppose you had an object here, suppose you actually try to compute the uh, energy density of the stress tensor here, we know it should be zero because it's the Minkowski vacuum, zero to leading order, okay? forgetting the energy of one or two Hawking quantum, it's zero. How does it come out to be zero? In the Lindner frame, it's very hot. The temperature is two pi over S, it's full of quanta. So you would think, hey, there's a lot of energy there. How much energy? The energy density of a radiation is proportional to the temperature to the power four with all the factors, this is the energy density uh, of the radiation, the radiation. So how do you actually find a stress tensor that has expectation value zero at the horizon? And the, the point is, as Candler pointed out, that if you go to, let's say, the Rindler vacuum, so you don't have the Rindler vacuum, but you have Rindler vacuum plus excitations, but if you went to the Rindler vacuum, the black hole was completely cooled. In the black hole context, the Rindler vacuum is called the Boulware vacuum. So if you had like nothing coming out of the black hole, even the Boulware vacuum, then what happens is the Casimir energy in the Rindler frame for a scalar field, if you take the modes I had written before and you compute the energy of the ground state, it actually is negative. It's negative, the Casimir energy is negative by this value. The excitations you add to it have this much energy just from ordinary thermodynamics, the rho t to the four you learned in undergraduate physics, and that's how the total becomes zero. Okay. So, so what Candler did was he computed the energy density of the Boulware vacuum, and he showed it was diverging towards minus infinity as you go close to the horizon. And he wrote the exact answer in four dimensions, but we only want the part close to the horizon, and close to the horizon just one over distance to the field. Okay. So that's going to be crucial for us, because now what we are going to see is that, okay, so this is how we did the calculation, the calculation of the Cassegrain energy, you take the field modes and you expand them outside the horizon. This is the kind of expansion we had before. If you want the Rindler vacuum, which is along with the Boulware vacuum, so I'm writing OB now. If you do the Boulware vacuum is defined by the fact that all these Fourier modes give zero on it. So as I said, this is called the Boulware vacuum. Then you compute this T00 of S there by taking point splitting the operators and normal stuff that is in quantum fields and curved space with great effort. And then you find that the uh, Cassegrain energy of that vacuum is this negative, negative value. So everything ties in together well. There's a negative Casimir energy, you fill it with the Rindler quanta, you come up to energy equal to zero, and that's why the, vacuum, the horizon is smooth. That's the picture of the normal black hole. Let's look at this a little bit more detail. So what are these wave functions that you have to solve for to put in the field expansion? This was the barrier we had the wave equation written on an earlier slide, but a solution to the wave equation, the important part is it has lots of wiggles as you go close to the horizon. So you know, because it's blue shifting, it's going to wiggle very fast, and that's going to be very crucial to us. There are infinitely many oscillations here, and that's because of the high blue shift. Or if you go to some coordinate 
tortoise coordinate, they can say the effective distance up to the horizon is basically infinite, so it makes an infinite number of oscillations. And this is a decay under the barrier, and at infinity just becomes a traveling wave. So that's what the wave functions look like that we actually put into the calculation. So the important thing is there are lots of oscillations here just because of blue shifting, and let's see what that does. So now you take the scalar field there, and let's see what actually happens if instead of a black hole, you actually have an ECO. So again, you have to suppose you take an ECO, and suppose it has zero temperature. How are you going to describe that? You're going to take the field and expand that in modes. And this time I've called the modes B instead of calling them A. And then you have still the mode functions as before. You can write them down. And you have these things uh, B over here. And with that, this would be the vacuum state of the ECO. Okay. I'll draw the picture for the mode function this time on a later slide. But right now, let's just note this defines the vacuum state, let's say, so that if that ECO is completely cold at temperature equal to 0, uh, you would get that. And then if you want to know the energy density just outside the ECO, you have to the same point split calculation. You do this, and you'll compute the energy density. Okay. So you can do the same method. But let's just look at what the mode functions look like. Now, all around here, the potential is the same. So the mode function basically looks the same all over. It also has a large number of wiggles up to here because they went to high redshift. That was the crucial point. If you're going all the way up to redshift, you know, one trillion, then there'll be one trillion oscillations over here, or log of that. Inside also the wave function continues, but I don't. It, that it depends on what's happening in the ECO. But very interestingly, and this is the crucial point, I don't actually care about the details. And why not? Because if there are many oscillations here, if I want to find the stress tensor at this point, I can just make wave packets out of this. And what all that matters is how the functions are oscillating over here, and it doesn't matter what they are doing over here. So if I want the answer over here, I can simply go and make wave packets out of these guys. In another language, you could say if you go to the tortoise coordinate, then it doesn't look to be changing frequency, but the distance is infinite, keeps oscillating. And if you want to compute the answer over here, you don't particularly care what's doing at infinity. You can uh, make local wave packets, and you'll get an answer. And that's the crucial step, because with that, you find that, uh, so we are asking the question, why can the temperature of the ECO not be actually zero? And the point is, by this condition, we need to have the fact that 2gm over r should always be less than 1, because otherwise, the black hole actually collapses. So at any radius, you can't be inside the horizon. That was our condition. We'll see that that condition is actually violated when we have this kind of Cassini energy. So this is the crucial argument. I'll give you the more details on the next slide. But if we understand this, we have understood the crucial point of the talk. And let's proceed this way. At r equals infinity, the total mass was m. So that was our definition of what the mass is in the ECO. Now suppose the ECO is zero temperature. That this region close to the horizon, I've drawn like a fairly big band. But let's say this is just from Planck length to 100 Planck lengths. If you just integrate the energy density I showed you before, the Cassini energy density from Planck length to 100 Planck lengths, the amount of mass you find in that is order minus m. Okay, it's minus m. Okay, so the mass at infinity is m. The function m of r at this radius has to be now roughly 2m. Okay, it could be 1.5, but it's just parametrically bigger. So it's not m, it's more like, let's say, 2m. But now you have a problem. If you just look at what is happening at this dotted line, the mass inside this is 2m. I'm still in the semi-classical domain, so I can still use my logic of you know, what light cones should be doing. And that's why I put a little band here to prove the ECO slightly outside the quantum domain. But here, I have a mass 2m, which is confined in the radius, which is only 2gm. But the horizon radius of something of mass 2m is 4m. So this thing, this object, is actually well inside the horizon radius. So if you try to look at a structure of light cones on this dotted line, they actually point strictly inwards. Okay. And so this guy can't, can't be stable. This guy has to collapse. So this is the, the essence of the argument. And let's just look at a few of the steps. So here we compute the energy of this shell of radiation here. It's a negative energy density. So that's what the minus sign is doing. It's the Cassini energy of that for the Boulware vacuum. And this is the redshift factor. So you just go ahead and you compute that, that energy density. And you find an answer, which is order 1 times m with a minus sign. This is what I was calling minus m. That's the actual answer. So the, the mass which is inside the radius of the ECO must be the mass at infinity plus beta m, because they had negative cast energy there. This is what I was calling 2m in our colloquial way of speaking, but it is you know 1 plus something of 1 times m. And this violates the condition that you don't have a horizon. Uh, 2gm over r should always be less than 1 on the surface of the ECO. And there we are finding that it's actually violated. Yeah. So just to 
just to make sure I understand correctly. So you're saying that if the normal in the black hole and the positive and the negative, when I have the radiation which is positive, exactly. and they're compensating, they are compensating, and that's why the black hole has the same mass, you know, and the horizon at infinity. Yes. And now in the ECO, if you're not putting any radiation at all, if you're saying there's no Hawking radiation there, the ECO has zero temperature, yes. then you just get the negative Casimir energy, which is about the same mass as the mass as the black hole, and therefore the garbage inside has to be twice the twice as heavy. That's exactly. So right. therefore you must. So the logic is therefore you must put radiation there. Exactly. To fill up all this extra, to get one 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 over tau to the fourth. That's exactly thing. right. Okay. That's okay. exactly Thanks. right. Thanks. Thanks. I'm just. So we will check. So what happens? Zero temperature is, is exactly exactly what you said, and the same thing works at, at any temperature, but not exactly the Hawking temperature. If you take any temperature less than T Hawking, then basically the same thing happens because unless you fill it up to that level, if you fill it only half to that level, you know you still have the same problem. Instead of getting an extra minus m, you get a maybe a minus m by two. But it doesn't help you. You know, you're way inside the, the radius, and so you can just see the calculations here. And uh, let me not belabor that. The, the point is exactly as you said, just summarize. And the, it's interesting that a very similar thing actually happens if the temperature of the ECO is bigger than the Hawking temperature. So it's a similar argument, but I just try to spell it out here again. This time, the energy in this particular band here will actually be positive. It will be of order plus m, okay? because the Casimir energy was like minus m. If we're just canceling for that, you'd have to fill that region with temperature at the Hawking rate, but now the temperature is higher, so it will be, be more like plus m. So now it becomes the, uh, it'll be something like uh, the energy of the shell is some gamma of t with gamma of order one, but with a plus sign here. And so the ma mass of the ECO is one minus gamma m. So this guy's mass is not m, but one minus gamma m. And we have a problem with that as well, because for one minus gamma m, you have to ask what radius are we at? Now, what we wanted as one of the conditions of the ECO was the redshift should be very high at the surface here. If the mass of that, let's say, is 1 minus gamma m, for the sake of argument, let's say it's a half m, not m, but half m, then you find that this radius must be approached close to the Schwarzschild radius for a half m, because otherwise you will never actually get any high redshift. If I put this at the original radius, which is appropriate to m, but the mass is only half m, it's like a star with no high redshift. So you can actually put, find out what this radius should be to be able to get the high redshift condition. This is only a few Planck lengths. So this radius here should be equal to the mass appropriate to this half m. This is what I was calling half m for the moment, if gamma is a half. It's only a little bit more than that, because the thin band of few Planck lengths. You add the shell in, which has this extra energy. That has also a small radius Planck length to 10 Planck length. That's epsilon prime. So important thing is, the whole radius of this thing here is of the order of 2 gm into 1 minus gamma t, but with some small numbers that don't matter. But already you have a problem, because if the total mass is m, it has a horizon radius this. And you can now see the guy as well inside the horizon radius. And again, this 2 gm over r collapse. Yeah. There's a question back there as well. Was there a question back there? OK, maybe not. Maybe I was confused. I have a, I have a question. Yeah. If I take the solution by Ibo Ampere, which is in a non-extremal, non, uh, non virtual microstate, zero temperature, just a classical solution, no temperature. You're telling us that essentially, if you take that solution and you look at all this, all this uh, Hawking quantum which are produced, because you know that solution looks like a black hole near the horizon, you know, has, so even if it's a classical, nice, happy, smooth solution, you're saying that that solution actually is going to be filled up with this Rindler. If I just build, build that solution, so I'm a guy yeah. out there in the galaxy, far away from the galaxy, I build that solution out of vacuum. Yeah. I build a I build a Ibu Pierre solution, which is you know Schwarzschild mass, uh, the black hole you know yeah. Schwarzschild radius, black hole mass, everything classical, clean classical solution. You are saying that in that solution you have this uh, radiation accumulating. This yeah. this uh, yeah. So the point is it has to be in thermal equilibrium, right? So I've assumed it's in thermal equilibrium. You can always take some object which is you know an isolated point in modelized space of configurations, which has stayed there for a long time and hasn't come to equilibrium. Then, of course, it doesn't apply because right in the beginning, I said it has a temperature so that assume this in thermal equilibrium, right? Mm -hmm. So if when we construct very simple fuzzball solutions, they are not in equilibrium. We just make one particular solution and the next solution is quite far away from there, right? It's not, these are like the analogs of the, in Pierre's case, very interesting that those solutions are actually close to 2GM. He can at least want, if he wants, he can make them close to 2GM. Yeah. But many of the fuzzball solutions, we make them at 3GM. It's just a question of principle that how does the horizon radius, how do we bypass that? The, we don't even have the high redshift. But if this solution is at 2 gm, but then yeah. I wait a bit and you know, get filled up with Hawking radiation, and then I'll have this problem. Yeah. Or it you, you, you will have this problem. Because if he took that solution, and then it computed the Casimir energy of the scalar fields living in the matter, if the metric outside that looks like the Schwarzschild metric up to 2 gm plus a little bit, you have to compute the Casimir energy like Christian Fulling did, or Candlas did of that, and you will get a negative answer. So the point is that normally we think of Casimir energy as being small, and so we don't think about it. But the point is, 
as you come close to the 2gm to the radius 2gm the density of the energy density of casimir g actually diverges to minus infinity so in that sense you have to worry about it yeah so you have to take a solution and compute that yeah it would be interesting to compute that yeah okay so now we have seen that uh, no eco can be can survive if its temperature was not equal to the hawking temperature parametrically and once that is true then we had already seen that the uh, entropy and the hawking radiation rate must matter so any eco must have the same thermodynamical behavior as the black hole and interestingly if you do that whole thing more carefully you know uh, in an average d dimension then keeping track of everything you can even relax the condition a little bit doesn't have to be within planck length of this thing even though we had given arguments why we expect them to be within a few planck lengths of this this argument works as long as planck length and this factor of m over mp and in four dimension this is root m so if you go a distance root m in planck units outside the horizon if that's how big your eco is uh, it still works so this so the, the all those things will have to have the same thermodynamical properties and i think this is an interesting step in trying to understand what generic fuzz balls might be like even though it's a classical uh, it's just a qualitative argument telling you how objects should behave because otherwise we had really no way of answering the question uh, if fuzz balls have no horizons why should they have the thermodynamic properties of black holes but now we see it's nothing to the fuzz balls if in any theory of gravity you manage to make something which stays there and the only thing we have put in is causality once you have 2 gm over r less than 1 light cones point inwards and then you can't support you that's all we have put in as as long as you have causality nothing can go faster than the speed of light light cones are inwards you go in that's the only input and then this is the output if somebody have a question for me let me there scale and not at the planck scale yeah absolutely if you look at this actually you have a huge range you can see that you know the m over m planck so you can it goes up to root m in planck unit so that's easily inside the space. oh root m root capital m yeah root capital m okay yeah. if you just put b equals 3 this is number of space dimensions if you put b equals 3 you'll get one this will be a four it's a half you get the root m it's a big number okay so let me take the last few minutes i'm basically uh, running out of time to say where we are on the information puzzle this is just maybe a separate thing so i'm switching gears a little bit i just want to summarize what the information puzzle is and what we have learned because i also want to say a little bit on what other approaches the information puzzle are doing these days and from what i have understood i just want to tell you what i have understood and how they differ from uh, what the fuzz balls do so well, this is the information puzzle you burn a piece of coal so you take a piece of coal with some initial state psi i just how how does coal behave you can calculate using qed and all the things you know about atoms and electrons the final state psi f okay so that we know in, in principle is difficult but we can do it and then so the coal here evaporates and become this radiation and then we can make a measuring device which checks if the final state of this is indeed psi f that's my device and if the you know since coal is a normal object we'll find that if we check if the if the state is psi f we get the answer yes with 100% probability so this is quantum mechanics 101 which you learned in high school okay now what happens if you make a black hole so you make a black hole let's say in some state by colliding two particles with great energy at cern there's your black hole and then it emits by pair production and then in what hawking found was it creates an entangled state of the radiation with something but now that something is gone so you only have this entangled state of the radiation or even if you have a remnant that something is there but the important thing is the radiation now entangled with what is left behind and now this time if you try to make a machine to actually check what state this is in you can't get a unique answer 100% of the time for example if there are five terms in the sum psi1 tensor chi1 plus psi2 tensor chi2 and so on then sometimes if you measure you'll get psi1 sometimes you'll get psi2 and so on so this time there's no unique answer and so what what hawking's point was there is a black hole disappears then we're left with something over here on which it doesn't have any state because there's no measuring device which if it takes identically produced copies of this each time you'll get the same answer yes i am in this state so this doesn't actually have a state at all and that's the information puzzle okay so now we can actually take regional hawking's argument and people have worried a lot about you know how rigorous it is you know can small quantum gravity effects change it and so on but using properties of quantum information theory now we have a more rigorous version of this so you can make it completely rigorous into let's say it's called hawking's theorem now that putting in this small correction theorem from 2009 and a uh, sort of extension we made to that a few years ago you can actually make the following statement i'm just putting it now in colloquial terms but if you want the epsilon and deltas you can go back to the original papers so go to go to this list and see which of these you would like to keep if the exact quantum gravity theory is unitary let's assume that 
just behave like a normal unitary theory. There's no information loss in that. You require normal laboratory physics to hold to a better and better approximation as you recede further and further from the black hole. So the black hole is there. If I go arbitrarily far from it, I should see no surprises. I can open up Polsinski's textbook and know what low energy physics behaves like. It's just strings and gravitons and brains interacting exactly like a way I know in string theory. So you put that in also. Suppose you are happy with that. And then you require the radiation that you got in the exact theory is actually in a pure state. Like it came out like a piece of coal, it actually has a state. Lots of people seem to want that also. They want the page curve to come down. That's what it means. Suppose you want all these things. Then what the theorems tell you is that you cannot obtain any low energy semi-classical approximation around the horizon. You cannot obtain low energy semi-classical physics in any approximation. So that if somebody said that out of the exact degrees of freedom, he makes some code subspace or effective degrees of freedom that behave like semi-classical dynamics around the horizon in any approximation, it's not possible. So this fact is not obvious at all, because normally if you have a very complicated system, like this table, which is made of lots of atoms, and you want to study some low energy property, like you know, just vibrations of the table, you don't need to know where every atom is. You get some effective dynamics of a piece of wood with certain density, and you know you get the vibration spectrum of the, of the table. That's what people were trying to do all this time. And I think the confusion that are still persisting in the literature about why people think there could be some alternative to first balls, all go back to this point, because one way or the other, People now seem to agree that, okay, the exact theory might be like a first ball, but somehow you can make a semi-classical approximation where it looks like this. And it is not obvious at all that this is not possible. And the reason, of course, is very clear because this was possible that you could take this particular approximation. You see Hawking's problem in this approximation, and then you would say, okay, but this is an approximation. I mean, the exact theory, the page curve comes down, the semi-classical theory goes up. But that's what these theorems do. They use the power of the strong similarity relation in quantum information theory, and they tell you that no, in this particular situation, the approximation and the exact, the two graphs have to track each other. If the approximate graph goes up, the exact graph has to go up. It can only be down from that by order epsilon. Okay. So in fact, what are we actually arguing about these days? Because what's happening is that in all the papers I'm seeing about the wormhole approach, not the Euclidean kind of talk we heard today, but if you go and ask what's happening in the Lorentzian section, they will tell you what they're looking for is that in some way of looking at the black hole, Sometimes they use the word code subspace, sometimes some other language like that. You want to get effective lower energy semi-classical dynamics in some approximation. Now it turns out that's not possible. And I'm just going to try to tell you what actually happened in some of those papers. Yes, there was a question back there. For me. Yeah. So just to make this slide perhaps even more concrete. Yeah. Is there a way to ask the question on the boundary, the fact that there are these B and C objects? So the way you have drawn them, this B and C refer to some piece of the geometry that's not close to the boundary. And if we stick to, let's say, ADS-CFT kind of picture, yeah. every kind of question that we ask must have some, you know, a version on the boundary. So is there a way to phrase precisely on the boundary what it means to have these entangled pairs near the horizon? Okay, good. Yeah, so let me say that. So near the horizon, just the way I drew it, because there's no more space here. But what I would like to think of it as, so I have some ADS region. And then as everyone does these days, let's imagine it couples to some flat space region outside, which I think you call the reservoir or something. Let's couple it to that. So this guy, I assume, then goes out of the ADS, and it actually goes out to the flat. Okay. So I'm actually, so the, any semi-classical picture in which it includes the fact that these pairs are produced, this guy goes out to 3M, 4M, and then continues out to 100M, so it's got to the flat space region. I'm assuming that, though I didn't draw it here. And now I can make my statement again. At infinity, when I said that I, at infinity, as you go further and further away from the black hole, you get normal physics. I mean that in that flat space region, if I keep going further and further out, I will get to normal physics. That's no, the no, no. The far away part I'm okay with, but the fact that this B and C pair was produced near the horizon, that thing also we need to translate to the boundary. Okay, so I don't need to translate that because that's the claim made by the people who would like to argue that from the exact gravitation theory, a semi-classical gravity approximation in a code subspace exists. Because people are asking for a semi-classical approximation to the gravity theory around the horizon region, and I'm saying it's not possible. Samir, could you remind of the ingredients that went into this statement? Remind you of what? Of the ingredients that went into the theorem. You, it's what you said in the previous slides, but could you give the summary of what the essential physical input is that makes it such that there is no semi-classical? So the input is, I put all the inputs here. There's not a single extra one required. 
we just have to see what this means. So normal laboratory physics at infinity means the following for me. If I go very no, far no, from I, the black... I'm actually, I'm actually good with these statements, but really what I'm asking is you put these three things in and there's something you take to be given about the system you're talking about that has a horizon or, I mean, what is it? Is it the red shifts that's doing it? Is it the no, blue shifts so, that's doing yeah, it? Yeah, good. So if you have the semi-classical picture, all you need is that in the semi-classical picture on the horizon, one thing you don't have is, a, is the following choice. As long as you have semi-classical picture, box Y approximately zero is forced upon you for long wavelengths, let's say one meter to five kilometers. Mm -hmm. With that, you will have to get Hawking's entangled pairs up to some approximation where the corrections come from some quantum gravity effects we don't know. That's the starting point. So if you have a semi-classical approximation, this word has to mean something. If you have the semi-classical approximation around the horizon for low energies, let's say one meter to three kilometers, you will have to get these pairs at that stage. And then the point is, those pairs will lead you into Hawking's argument. Any small corrections that can't save you, and so you end up here. Okay, so uh, how is this related to the old, if, if at all, to the old arguments from the 1990s uh, by Toft and others that uh, there is no effective field theory description that simultaneously talks about infalling particles, or like the bees that can go in and out, and the Hawking quanta? Right? So there was because of the huge blue shifts and stuff like that, that you cannot in effective field theory consistently describe both of those phenomena in falling. Yeah, I think those arguments made no sense to me. I spent a long time on them. But so this is what's a, called this the good is completely slicing. completely separate from that kind of thinking. It's separate from that thinking. Completely separate from that thinking. If you do what's called a good slicing, you never end up with the high blue shift. Those was using the Schwartz slicing and arguing high blue shift will do something. It was a coordinate artifact. We really dug into it a lot. We actually wrote a couple of papers about it, but it's a blue shift effect. Okay. Five minutes, good? Okay. Okay, so then we ask, why are we into this trouble? Why did we want this picture of the black hole in the first place? And that's because no hair arguments told us that, you know, they suggested we have to have this picture. In no hair arguments told us everything goes inside, then it's a runaway process, the light goes turning inwards, we have to go there. But in that context, let's see what the first boss did. So when we actually try to find the nature of bound states that we had said, uh, you find it breaks the no hair theorems and actually produces things which don't have a horizon. And then that's the end of the puzzle. As I was saying, Gibbons and Warner showed us exactly what goes wrong with the no hair theorems. You can even compute the radiation for some of them, and you can see it's coming out like that of a normal body. And in this talk, we have seen the generic fuzzball states will automatically also have the thermodynamic properties of black holes, even though they don't come out radiation from a surface. There's no information puzzle there. And we heard related ideas about radiation from black holes in, in, in Emil's talk. Because there's no information puzzle and it's like a normal body because after all, it's the planet. So if I had to put this back in the context I had before, exactly what I said about the black hole, I would say for the first ball, you take a first ball in each of state psi i, calculate instead of QED, use string theory, the final state psi f, and then you construct a measuring device to check if the final state is psi f, and you'll get the answer yes 100% of the time. I just repeated what I said for coal, just replace the coal by first ball and QED by string theory. Looks like another trivial slide, but it's important because when you go back and ask what these other people are doing with the wormhole paradigm, one of these things is going to go wrong. Okay. So let's ask, what are the other approaches trying to do? I just roughly call them the wormhole paradigm, but you know, they do lots of things. And fortunately, there's one very nice collection of papers by Marlow from Maxfield, which actually comes closest to trying to answer the question because they work in knowledge and signatures. So you can actually ask what's actually happening to their radiation. And what they did was, they, in that picture, the matter inside the hole goes off into a baby universe. And the baby universe for different black holes, they can interfere with each other because they are identical particles. So if two of them are in the same state, you know, then you have to treat them like bosons. And in that sense, they see each other. But the horizon remains smooth to a first approximation. Their whole goal is to make the horizon smooth to a first approximation. And they actually write down the fact that the Hawking pairs look like exactly what they were. And there is a small correction. And there is a smallness of the correction. Well, what's the new thing between this and Hawking? And the new thing is that this extra correction can actually mix different copies of the black hole in the interior. That's the new point. The baby universes can mix. So it's still a small correction, but they can all mix. So do they have a picture where they can actually get something close to Hawking radiation and actually save unitarity in some way? What do they have? Fortunately, Maxwell wrote a very nice paper recently where he actually made an explicit bit model of everything that was contained in the three long papers, which are each 90 pages which Marov and Maxfield wrote, but everything is now extracted in this bit model. So we can go and ask what the bit model does. So Maxfield was kind enough to have a long correspondence with us, so which is still ongoing to clear some, some details, but I you know, clarified with him what the basic point was, and he says, okay, we can agree on this much. 
it turns out one step here breaks down. And what is that step? So as we said, if the horizon is smooth to a first approximation, the phase curve can't come down. That's the small correction theorem. We can't do this. He's kept the horizon smooth. And so what happens? What happens in his bit model? So you take his uh, thing with the initial state. In the cone, we had an initial state which had psi i. Then for the cone or for the fuzz balls, we could use either QED or string theory to compute psi f. And he says you can't do that. So the middle step is actually missing. Well, if you can't compute psi f, what does it mean? It means that to actually find out the final state, you have to do a lots and lots of measurements because you can't check what it is, compute what it is, and just to do one measuring device to check it. And if you have to do lots and lots of measurements on a state produced the same way multiple times, then all the different copies can interfere with each other, and then something new might happen. So we actually took his bit model. We could see the page curve is actually going up. So we drilled down into it to see exactly where the changes happen. And the changes happen because this step is not present. One way to uh, recast that, though so he has more refined ways of uh, discussing, and we can you know, share the email exchange if you want to see exactly what he would say. But roughly speaking, if you have an ensemble average theory, if he doesn't have a given Hamiltonian, then in one instance of the thing, you don't actually know what you will get. But in any case, if you actually had a way to compute the psi f, you only had to do one measurement to check this. You can maybe do two measurements to check it if you really want to be sure. But uh, he would need e to the s measurements, or e to the e to the s measurements. And then he says that many baby universes can interfere, because the baby universe has e to the s particles. Its complex is e to the s. So if you do e to the e to the s measurements, they'll all interfere with each other. But if you actually had a calculation, you have to just check it once, as we had seen. And he says you can't do that. So this is just, so I, I just conclude. I won't do all the other things I was going to say. Uh, I'll just end here. But it seems to me that there's really no alternate to the Furball paradigm to understand what black holes are doing. Because in all the other approaches, when we drilled to the end, I just cut off some slides here. But in each case, I find when I actually go on to understand what's happening in terms of a bit model or simple quanta, something is changed, which is a little bit in conflict with what I would like to assume. So three assumptions I gave, that far away there's physics becomes normal, and the exact theory is unitary. One or the other goes, goes wrong. And the Maxfield thing is very nice, because it actually summarizes one explicit set of papers into a bit model, and you can see what's happening. And this, this is what changes. So I'll stop here. Thank you. So this is a very pressing question. Um, it's really yeah, I just have a comment. I think it was clear. I also tried to say during my talk that computing psi f, I don't think any kind of wormhole computation can give you psi f as a state because like you need to compute like or, or row which could be bra psi f cat psi f the matrix elements of that what these euclidean methods or effective wormhole methods can give you is some you know property of all those matrix elements of bra psi f cat psi f and some of them you can compute efficiently and some of them you can't so i think it's clear that if you want the precise psi f you have to do some quantum gravity wave function, which you know could be thought of as some fuzzball type of thing. Like it's not some, no, it's some delocalized wave function. I think that's okay. Like the conclusion is fine. Yeah. So I think the important point, which I think is not made sufficiently clearly in the entire community of people working on black holes, is that yes, people would agree that the exact thing should look like a fuzzball because otherwise, if you don't corrupt the horizon, you can't do it exactly. The people now agree that it should be like a fuzzball. But they are still trying to get a semi-classical approximation in the Lorentzian picture, not in your Euclidean wormholes. So I'm not uh, con uh, discussing that at the moment. But people are trying to get a Lorentzian effective picture. And what people are not clear about is that that's not possible. Uh, you have to give up something serious like we just saw in the Maxfield thing. Maxfield thing and uh, then we can decide whether we want to give that up. But we can't just take an approximation to, uh, to that and, and, actually, and actually get a semi-classical approximation. Maybe we can chat about this later since I should leave. From this. Okay, and uh, since uh, we're running a little late, we'll move immediately to the next talk as soon as we get set up. Okay. Bottom one, sure. Thank you so much.
to do anything. Okay. Uh, should we continue this guy? The small slides can be Okay. Check it. So our next talk of the afternoon session is by David Turton. He's going to tell us about evolutionary algorithms for multi-center solutions. Okay. Thank you very much to the organizers for putting on this very nice conference and for inviting me to speak. Uh, since we are running over, I will do my best, if possible, to trim a little from uh, the slides, uh, from, from the presentation, so that we don't completely derail the afternoon's proceedings. Um, and as always, when you're scheduled, the second one of a two-talk block with uh, no coffee break in between, that's a scenario you have to plan for. So I, I plan to leave the details towards the later part of the talk that can be skipped over if necessary. So we should uh, get the main ideas earlier. And uh, unlike that, we should be able to proceed. OK, so this work is this talk is based on a work I did with my now former PhD student, Sami Rawash who uh, defended his thesis a couple of months ago. And I will keep the broad introduction fairly brief since we had already many nice introductions from the speakers of the last two and a half days, who gave us very convincing arguments that the time is ripe to further the exploration of the internal structure of black holes. As we heard yesterday, a lot of progress has been made in studying black hole microstructure in string theory using both smooth horizonless supergravity solutions and their more stringy counterparts where we often may have some gravitational description of a, a long throat but then where we would have had the horizon we may get some very stringy microstructure structure which have if we have enough precision in our description we may be able to access i will be less ambitious in this talk, and I won't be aiming at some particularly stringy microstructure, I'll be working in the supergravity approximation. And I'll be studying a class of smooth horizonless supergravity solutions that involve non-trivial topological bubbles threaded by flux, which are known as either multi-center solutions or bubbling solutions. These black hole microgeometries and their stringier counterparts are, as we've heard already, interpreted in the context of the broader Fosbol proposal that quantum effects are important on the scale of the would-be horizon. And this is due to the finite size, ultimately, of the underlying bound state of the quantum gravity theory. And such that Hawking radiation is unitary, which, if we could demonstrate this in generality, would resolve the black hole information paradox. As I said, this talk is about multi-center supergravity solutions. And lots of solutions of this type have been constructed over the years, which have the same charges as uh, super, large supersymmetric black holes and with all the topological structure deep inside a near horizon throat. And these configurations are constrained by regularity up to possible orbifold singularities, absence of closed time-like curves, and importantly, charge quantization. Because of these constraints, actually constructing fully explicit examples of these solutions that are satisfying both regularity, absence of CTCs, and uh, charge quantization, and with all the parameters and physically relevant ranges, this is actually quite a hard task. And there are relatively few really explicit examples that we can uh, write down and that have been written down uh, in, in exact form, in closed form. And so in this talk, my goal is to tell you about a, an optimization algorithm, a computational approach, which combines a set of algorithms known as evolutionary algorithms and also a Bayesian optimization algorithm, which constructs numerically solutions satisfying all of these constraints including uh, both regularity and charge quantization. And I'll give you an explicit example of a novel five center configuration with no particular symmetry on the five centers. And we also have a seven center example in our paper. So my outline is to give a brief review of the basics of these multi-center bubbling geometries, focusing in particular on the scaling regime where they uh, all the topological structure is deep inside a near horizon black hole throat. I'll then take you through the two components of the algorithm, which are, are 
in two separate parts for reasons which will become clear momentarily, and then show the show you uh, the example. Okay, so in terms of the basic nuts and bolts of the supersymmetric bubbling solutions, they arise from supergravity theories, and uh, supersymmetry will be very important in what I'm doing. Everything I do with BC is metric. But the building blocks involve a set of harmonic functions on an R3 base space. There are a set of constraints which is required for regularity and absence of closed time-like curves. And then from this data, this basic data, there's a supergravity ansatz, which of course was the first step from which all this was derived, that maps this data to a supersymmetric supergravity solution involving metric and matter fields. And in that solution, the data that we specify in these harmonic functions gives rise to this non-trivial topological bubbles supported by magnetic flux. Now my slide didn't change because I tried to get this guy out of the way. Now, last one. Okay. So I'll be working in either five or six dimensions, but for concreteness in the talk, I'll focus on five dimensions. Large five-dimensional supersymmetric black holes have three electric charges. So for that reason, I'll have three abelian vector fields in this five-dimensional supergravity theory. And this arises, for instance, as a consistent truncation of type 2b string theory compactified on T5. These charges can correspond to D1 brains, uh, D5 brains, and momentum in a compact direction. So that's the same system we heard a lot about in yesterday's talks and with today. I will actually work slightly more generally than that because this formalism of multi-center solutions has been extended to also include an S2 triplet of non-abelian vector fields. And this was nice work of uh, Thomas Ortin and his uh, former students and postdocs, in particular of Pedro Ramirez. And the resulting theory, which is a five-dimensional n equals one supersymmetric Einstein-Young-Mills theory, can be embedded in heterotic string theory compactified on T5. And so our main motivation comes more from the abelian theory, but since it doesn't cost as much, it's quite easy to keep the discussion general and include also these non-abelian fields. So I'll do that throughout the talk. In the abelian sector, which will be familiar to the experts, but particularly for the people who haven't worked on this, we have a set of harmonic functions defined on this R3 base space. And I'll work relatively generally at the start where I'll have a, a label little n for the number of centers. And we'll have, um, we have three abelian um, uh, ve vectors. So this index i runs from uh, what runs over three indices, zero, one, and two. So I have eight harmonic functions. One, a function H describes the topological structure of the gibbons hawking space. I have three sort of functions in each, you can think of these as sort of electric and magnetic uh, functions. So these L's, you can think of them as encoding the electric kind of data of the centers and the K's are the magnetic data of the, the charges of the local centers. And one function m is related to angular momentum. So in total so far, I have eight harmonic functions on R3. And these together will combine to give me the supergravity fields uh, of the solution. As I said, I'm working slightly more generally than that. So we'll also have a non-abelian sector. And in the non-abelian sector, we'll have a, a kind of a monopole type configuration. It's a multi-center generalization of an SU2 colored monopole solution. And you can think of it in simple terms as follows. At each of the given talking centers, where we have the topology of, of the given talking function, there's also an SU2 colored monopole where there's a point charge surrounded by a cloud of magnetic flux, which effectively screens completely this magnetic charge as seen from infinity. So this may be not as familiar, but the upshot from our for our purpose is that this is not going to change in a substantial way the conserved charges of the solution. It also makes only a fairly minor change to the uh, analysis of smoothness. 
And for practical purposes, it induces, it, it introduces two extra harmonic functions. These functions will have poles at exactly the same centers that we already chose in the, uh, in the abelian sector. But we have some additional parameters, uh, lambda a in particular, which control the size of these monopoles. Uh, no, 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 uh, no, 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 no. The sig sigma is a parameter which will be fixed by regularity in a moment. The sigma, I, um, a, the index on sigma is uh, the center index. Yeah. yeah. Now, there, there will be a, in my bonus slides, if you want to see the details of the monopole, uh, uh, it involves the SU2 pali matrices. Uh, so, but yeah, you don't see that at this uh, at this level because there's there's an ansatz, there's a sort of hedgehog type ansatz for the SU2 uh, non-abelian vectors, and then it boils down to these two harmonic functions. These are just scalar functions. Okay, so your sigma, the question here was it was just here. It's going to get but, fixed. But the charges are macroscopic. So, is your S2 SU2 gauge field consi consisting of an enormous number of monopoles on top of each other? Um, there is a, you can think of this as that there is a topological charge associated to each of these um, here, but there, it's, it's sort of like an order one. In a moment, you'll see the topological uh, sort of quantum number, like the instanton number for that, but it's not a large number in okay. this case. Yeah. Uh, you'll see the flux in just a moment. Okay, so that's the physics input from the supergravity point of view. And now our task is to analyze the conditions for these configurations after we put it all together in the supergravity fields to be horizonless, smooth up to possible overfold singularities, asymptotically flat in 5D, and to satisfy the appropriate quantization of fluxes. So firstly, absence of event horizons and singularities gives us a bunch of relations which dr dramatically reduces the number of free parameters. So these, uh, I don't know how clear the, the later equations are on, on the screen, but okay, the, the, these little pr parameters, little l, little k, and little m were re related to the various harmonic functions with the capital letters of the same name. And so what we find is that the charges on the capital L functions get completely determined in terms of other data. Same for the sigma parameter that we were just discussing in the Q function, and the same for the charges of the angular momentum harmonic function. In addition to these constraints, we also have a set of bubble equations that constrain both the positions of the centers and the local charges. And the bubble equations take the following form. So we have a set of fluxes, which are the fluxes on each of the topological bubbles which are determined in terms of the parameters which are less constrained in this process now, the Ks and the Qs. And the bubble equations have a, a term on the left-hand side which is cubic in those. Here we have that uh, non-abelian flux term, which is interestingly independent of the lambda parameters, but only dependent on the gibbons hawking charges. And this is the thing you can think of as the SU2 topological charge. Now, the sigma was uh, already fixed to be k over q, and that doesn't come into the uh, topological flux. Um, so uh, on the right-hand side, then we have the terms which will be more familiar, which are the, uh, involve the L0s, the, the constants and the harmonic functions. And so, okay, when we're playing this game, it's useful to think what kind of thing, what kind of quantity is gonna be large or small. So, for practical purposes, we're going to think of the fluxes as large numbers. For implementing some numerics, that's going to mean that this term over here is going to be maybe, oops, this slide here. So each of the fluxes is going to be, say, tens. So this, this term is going to be in the order of thousands. We're going to keep the Gibbons Hawking charges to be plus or minus one. So the topological charge is just some order one decoration to that left hand side of the bubble equations. But we're going to work in a scaling regime. And this effectively means that the right-hand side of the bubble equations is gonna be scaled to be a very small number, like 10 to the minus three or something for practical purposes. And that, become, that comes because 
these distances RAB measured on the 3D base. We're going to do scaling of them to make them all very small, but then we're going to change units and multiply through by that small parameter to make this right-hand side very small. Okay, so this is our task. Uh, our main task is to solve this bubble equations. And so for configurations of little n centers, there are n minus one independent bubble equations. Uh, the sum over A is a trivial identity. And the main act in the game, like I said, we're gonna choose the Qs to be plus or minus one. So the main uh, things we're gonna be interested in are these little Ks, which are the flux parameters and the distances, or indeed the positions of the centers. These are the things that we have the possibility to vary to solve these constraints. Okay, so the next set of constraints is to impose asymptotic flatness in 5D. This gives us uh, that some of the given talking charges has to equal one. The constants in the L functions have to have product one. And we get another condition which fixes the constant in the M harmonic function. So these are um, not particularly important, but what will be very important is the quantization of the flux parameters. Because once we um, want to embed this whole thing in string theory, we need to make sure that we have only integer numbers of brains or charge, you know, momentum quanta or whatever going into the solution. And so that means that these dimensionful quantities, little k's, are quantized in specific units. The precise units are not super important, but what it will tell us is that the ratios between these flux parameters, which are the dimensionless uh, numbers, these are ratios of integers and in particular rational. So all you need to know from this is that these, uh, these kappas are integer parameters when we embed it all in string theory. So then I said that the, you know, the extra topological uh, the, the extra non-abelian flux doesn't change too much the charges. So just to show you how that goes, again, for us, if we think of the non-abelian coupling to be just some order one constant, then we'll again um, have charges which are quadratic in fluxes. And we'd like these charges to be just, you know, some appropriately large number for, for the numeric. So let's say 10 to the three. Well, then this will be just some order one shift of that in the one brain harmonic function. And uh, so these will be the conserved charges of the solution. So everything at this point can be read off. Once you've solved all the quantization and smoothness constraints, you can read off the charges. One thing to note, however, is that if we want to experiment with different configurations and changing some flux parameters or changing some positions of some sensors, we want to check whether our, we do have appropriately large fluxes. That, that's actually a somewhat non-trivial calculation, which has a certain computational cost. So in terms of practical terms, that means that these functions Q1 and Q5 are somewhat computationally expensive to evaluate. And so it's not an easy constraint to place on the process to say, let's just give me nice large charges and in the right regime, we will have to work slightly harder to actually implement that in practice. Okay, so before I do a very explicit clean analytic example, are there any questions about the general setup? Not so far, good. Okay, so uh, before we get our hands dirty with a computer, we can do one very easy example on pen and paper, which will give us a little intuition for, um, in particular, the quantization conditions. So let's just consider two centers, and let's uh, work with solutions which uh, where both of the centers have non-zero charges so that everything is nice and smooth in five dimensions. Then we can solve everything analytically. There is a gauge uh, one can there's a certain notion of gauge transformation in this formalism where one can ensure that the k parameters are equal and opposite on the two centers. And because the sum of the given Hawking charges is equal to one, then we just have one parameter s where the two charges are going to be one plus s and minus s. And the distance between the two centers is going to be uh, encoded in this variable c. Okay, so because it's only two centers, we can solve everything on pen and paper and uh, this distance between the two centers is completely algebraically fixed by the one independent bubble equation in terms of this data of the flux parameters k and the Gibbons Hawking charge s. 
And from this data, after we implement the quantization conditions to pass from the dimensionful flux parameters K to the integer flux parameters Kappa, we get relations for the integer numbers of one brains, five brains, and momentum in terms of the, the four independent parameters of the uh, S, Kappa one, Kappa two, and Kappa three, which I'm gonna rename Kappa just for the next slide's purpose. So that's so far so nice, four, four parameters from which we derive the, the charges and so on. And if you prefer to think that uh, you wanna think of the charges as the things that you choose and fix, you can take your four parameters to be N1, N5, Kappa, and S. And that determines the configuration completely. Now, when we combine all of the constraints, quantization of these charges and angular momenta, we find that we can't uniquely choose N1, N5, S, and K. There are some constraints, uh, N1, N5, S, and Kappa. So N1, N5 divided by Kappa must be an integer. And S times S plus one over kappa also has to be an integer. And those relations are crucial to obtaining the microscopic description of the bubbling solutions from the holographic CFT. And in the dual symmetric product orbifold uh, point of the holographic CFT, this is determined, this is described in terms of a fractional spectral flow. This was just to illustrate for you that the quantization conditions really are important in practice for uh, building these solutions and embedding them in, in string theory and holography. Okay, so these solutions, by the way, were, are the BPS three charge spectral flow circular supertubes that Stefano Masai talked about yesterday. Um, okay, so far so good. Now let's go to more than two centers where far less is known uh, analytically and explicitly. But when we go to more than two centers, we also have a new phenomenon where we have scaling solutions. Scaling solutions are a category of solutions in which the distances between the centers in the R3 base can be made arbitrarily small with relatively minimal changes to the asymptotic charges. And this was a phenomenon observed back by Nick Yosef and Wang in 2007. And there've been various constructions of that by Pierre and others uh, since then. And as I said before, the scaling of these distances is equivalent to rescaling units in the bubble equations and multiplying the right-hand side by uh, the small parameter lambda, where lambda is less than one. <coughs> now we can take a formal limit where lambda goes to zero. And in that limit, after performing the rescaling, so we have this left-hand side of the bubble equations in rescalinas is equal to lambda times some right-hand side. So formally, if we worked a leading order uh, in one over lambda uh, for, for small lambda, then we find a homogeneous form of the bubble equations where we just have right-hand side equals zero. And this is exactly the same limit as is done when people zoom into a near horizon ADS2 throat of a black hole solution. So if you did this for the corresponding large three charge supersymmetric black hole, you would zoom into the very near horizon ADS2 region where we have S3 fiber over ADS2. So we won't want to go all the way down into that limit. We want to construct the full solutions with the full asymptotically flat uh, region joined. So we will want to work at spartanate lambda. However, we'll use the homogeneous form of the bubble equations as the first step in the method uh, that I'm gonna outline in the next uh, few slides. Okay, so we're building this algorithm on the shoulders of people who worked you know, over several years to find various methods for constructing these interesting types of solutions in this regime. And early approaches to solving those bubble equations involve specifying some set of flux parameters, often sort of you know, chosen with a combination of art and science, and then solving for the distances that uh, should be implied by the bubble equations. And if you can put everything, you know, if you have some extra axisymmetry and you put everything on the line, for instance, then that's a solvable problem. However, if you wanted to break that symmetry and have generic separations, generic distances and uh, positions in R3, then it quickly becomes a difficult problem. And uh, not, not just that it's 
difficult in practice, there's an in principle problem that comes up that after you solve the bubble equations for the distances, it may turn out that these distances do not represent actual genuine possible distances between a collection of points in R3. You might violate a triangle inequality. And then the solution is no good, it has to be thrown out. Uh, so that's a problem with this approach. And so people worked hard and thought of a different approach that exploits the fact that the bubble equations are linear in the flux parameters. So you could pick a subset of flux parameters, let's say all the k's for the harmonic function number two, or almost all of them. And then you could say, okay, let me try and specify some collection of points in R3 such that I fix first my distances, and then I try to solve the bubble equations as a linear system for the flux parameters. And that's a pretty good method. Uh, this was uh, Avila, Ramirez, and Rupers in 2017. It works in general for both scaling and non-scaling solutions. And although it's an improvement, there is a complication that you have a potential conflict with the quantization conditions. As I mentioned before, because these uh, are all quantized in particular units, the ratios of the dimensionful flux parameters are ratios of integers, and so they have to be rational numbers. However, when we're solving for the flux parameters, in a linear system in which some of the positions that we input were irrational, then generic solutions that we're going to get from this linear system are also irrational numbers. And ratios of generic irrational numbers are irrational, and so we're not going to have a hope to solve these uh, things on the nose. We may be very close to a, a real solution, but it's not uh, going to be an actual solution that comes from integer numbers of quantum string theory. So to deal with this problem, people thought of a couple of possible approaches that we could, and, and th this, this works, that you can arrange non-generic um, locations of the centers such that you cook it up such that all the distances are rational by construction. You can put things all on a line, as I mentioned before, or all on a circle in some ZK symmetric, ZN symmetric configuration. And you get interesting exact solutions that you can fully analytically um, but with somewhat limitation that you're imposing some symmetry by hand. Alternatively, uh, Josef and um, Pierre and, and Pedro <coughs> said, okay, let's consider some generic center locations and we'll construct approximate solutions to the bubble equations. It won't be exact, but we're, we can, you know, construct some approximate solutions by simply rounding off, truncating any irrational fluxes that you might encounter in your problem. And then you haven't really solved it. You've got only some approximate solution to, and you hope there's maybe a nearby exact configuration. And you can try and do better by resolving the bubble equations in the traditional way to find a nearby thing. But it, again, it, you get back to the problems of the first approach that it's both hard and you might violate some triangle inequalities. So you might not be able to get uh, solutions. And also as you increase the number of centers, this becomes harder and harder. So. Uh, it's not clear whether this method is feasible when you get beyond about four centers. So this is all motivations for the approach we developed, which can deal with arbitrary numbers of centers. So we're gonna follow most of those initial steps that I just outlined in one of those particular approaches. But in the last step, we're gonna use a computer to vary the positions of the centers algorithmically with the goal of constructing numerical solutions. So it has two main advantages. Firstly, as I said, we can consider any number of centers, subjects of course to computational resources, but we can access potentially this regime of large numbers of centers, which may get us maybe a little closer to the kind of space-time foam pictures that Samir was drawing in the previous uh, talk. And moreover, we impose no symmetry whatsoever on the positions of centers, so everything is uh, completely generic. If we want to, we can adapt the algorithm if we wanted to have some particular hierarchies between centers, but a priori, there's just no symmetry whatsoever. And are, are you guaranteed to find solutions this way, or can you, are you just trying to relax to some kind of, um, it's like do the best you can, and if you miss by a little bit, what does it mean? Does it mean you're in the class of things you considered, there just are no BPS solutions, and any solutions are slightly non-extremal? Uh, I will get to that in a moment. So when we take this approach, there is definitely no guarantee that there exists a good solution nearby. But most of the time, 
observationally, when we run the algorithm, it, it, it finds that out by its own accord. And, and this is um, due to the fact, which was noticed previously in approaches to solving these equations, is that if you just choose a random configuration, almost certainly you'll have CTCs or some other pathology, and quickly you'll see that and discard it. And it's by no means guaranteed that if you just sprinkle random things, you'll get a nice scaling solution. No, you have to allow the algorithm to explore with some pseudo-random generations, you know, some explore the phase space a little, pick out the good ones, and then when you get something good, you know, it explores that we get an approximate solution, and then we can talk about the precision, whether we, whether what, how confident we can be whether there really is an exact solution nearby. There's always going to be a limit to the numerics there. Um, but we see some quite clear uh, phenomenon whereby, you know, most, you know, well more than half of the solution the, of the candidates get discarded at early stages of the algorithm for just having CTCs. But when we get something good, it looks really very good. So you, I'll quantify that at the end with the example. Um, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, as I said, the algorithm is gonna have two components. Uh, and that's because the, the last step of making slight variations of the distances is gonna be no good unless we feed it a good starting configuration. So a lot of the work at the first half of the algorithm is to generate a good seed solution, which we can have reasonably high confidence that there's gonna be a good exact scaling solution nearby. And then we can try and um, vary the, the, make small variations of the locations of the centers. And so to generate these good seed solutions, we use a Bayesian optimization algorithm, which I'll give a lightning introduction to in a moment, in which the variables are a subset of the fluxes. And then we do an initial check for CTCs and we put a cutoff at reasonably large charges. And only if those things are, 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 are only if those tests are passed, does the algorithm pass that configuration to the evolutionary algorithm, which varies the positions. Okay, so first part of the algorithm. There are always some choices in what we're gonna look at. So we chose to set up random initial positions of the centers with given talking charges plus or minus one. This means that if we manage to build good solutions, they will be completely smooth in five dimensions with no orbifold singularities whatsoever. Uh, that is possible to do uh, as it happens only if the number of centers is odd. If the number of centers is even, there's gonna be one center which will have a given talking charge two, so a Z2 orbifold singularity, but that's life. And then our game is to consider a subset of the flux parameters, these Ks. We'll take them to be in the charge direction zero and one not for all of the centers, but just for some subset. And we'll impose that we get appropriately large charges only by solving the homogeneous equations because that's an easier task. And this will give us something in the scaling regime. And we do that by iterating over these steps. So we let the algorithm generate randomly some uh, candidates. We solve the homogeneous bubble equations for the remaining flux parameters. That's a direct analytic uh, solution. Then we do the step of rounding off those flux parameters. So we no longer have a, a solution, it's only an approximate solution. And then we're gonna compute the charges Q1 and Q5, which, which is only possible after we've solved the homogeneous bubble equations and check if it's good enough and, if, and then do a CTC check. And so this Bayesian optimization will cycle through various candidates before it chooses something good to pass onwards. So once we've got a solution with acceptably large charges, we rescale the distances to get into the scaling regime. And then we'll check the CTC criterion, which is not the only CTC check, but it's, it's useful at this point to do an initial CTC check because um, that will give us confidence that the, it's worth proceeding. And we'll also check another necessary algebraic condition to have a nearby scaling condition. And then at the last point, we'll then pass to the second half of the algorithm. Okay, so for the Bayesian optimization, as I said, we're gonna choose 
an appropriate subset of the flux parameters. This is maybe more detailed than it needs to be. What you need to know is that we're just going to pick order three to five of the flux parameters, not necessarily all of them, because it's not particularly useful and it would just cost us computational time to do a more detailed optimization. But we just pick some handful of three or five flux parameters, assign randomly values to the rest of the flux parameters for the two out of the three charge direction, zero and one. And as it happens, one charge from the third harmonic function on the first center, uh, oh, sorry, not the first center, but the, uh, the asymptotic uh, one. Oh, no, sorry, it is the first center. First center, first center is labeled by zero. And then all of the rest of them will be solved uh, in the two direction. Now, as I mentioned briefly, if we consider the charges, uh, Q and Q5, as functions of these parameters that we're going to vary, they're computationally expensive. And a standard way, or, or one standard method for dealing with that problem is this Bayesian optimization. OK. It's just a lag. OK. So lightning review for anybody who hasn't seen Bayesian optimization before. I certainly hadn't before this project. So suppose we have some function that we want to find an acceptably good maximum value. It doesn't necessarily have to be an exact global maximum in this case. It might be you want, want to maximize it exactly. In our case, we just want to have large enough charges, Q1 and Q5. So for us, this a schematic orange curve represents an unknown function, which for us is the minimum of Q1 and Q5, thought of as functions of three or five flux parameters. So the x-axis is a schematic for these three or five flux parameters that we're going to allow to vary. Okay, because this unknown function is hard to uh, evaluate, you know, or it's computationally expensive to evaluate, we have a limited number of chances to observe this at particular points on the <laughs> x-axis. So the black dots here represent samples that we've observed the function at a few points. And so there's a Bayesian process. So we call the orange curve this unknown objective function. We've evaluated it a few times, so we, we don't actually know the orange curve, but we're looking to infer it. Or at least we're looking to infer where are a good few next set of points that we want to sample it at to find, try and find an acceptably good maximum. So the standard approach here is to assume there's some Gaussian distribution over possible functions. And there's some prior we should put to uh, say how effectively, you know, how wiggly we expect this function to be, you know, how many, what's the prior distribution on Fourier harmonics? Well, basically we uh, generate random guesses for possible functions that could pass through these points uh, via, you know, a Gaussian statistical process. And the mean of those functions is what we call the surrogate function, which is our best guess as far as we are in the process of what the true function might be. So again, the unknown true function is this orange dotted line. We don't know it yet, but we can make a best guess, which is the blue curve. The next part of the algorithm is, sorry? Uh, here, it, it's sort of a choice, but you know, you, you use some, um, you know, for, for this, you have a prior both for the mean and which is usually some constant. And then there's some uh, quantification of uh, you know, the, the, the addition, which is some radial basis function uh, as the kernel. Um, are you familiar with this yeah, story? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, okay, so um, yeah, there's a whole story behind, behind that, but the, the details aren't super important. This, this is a schematic. Uh, description. So, okay, having having made some iteration of our best guess of the function, then there's an additional uh, step, which is that we should decide where the next point we should sample is going to be. And to decide that next point, we have to trade off the value of exploring function, exploring regions which have relatively high uncertainty as is over here, which is like exploration of the uncertain regions versus observing the function close to the current best maximum point, which is like exploitation of estimated maxima. Okay, and so this, there's again various strategies for this, uh, which is known as the acquisition function. 
And a standard one is known as expected improvement, where you basically take, you imagine that you only have one shot left to observe it, and you just use your statistical ensemble to get to maximize the expectation of the improvement of upon your current best guess on the maximum. So in this cartoon, the the point chosen will be in the most uncertain region. And then we imagine that we might observe some next value of the function, and then the whole process iterates. So we use this as a tool to generate acceptably large charges in the, in the flux uh, parameter space. OK, so after a successful run, we have an approximate solution to the bubble equations, to the homogeneous form of the bubble equations, with appropriately large charges. Then we generate another solution, which is again approximate by rescaling the distances, and do our checks on absence of CTCs and a necessary condition for a by scaling solution. And so if those are, and those may fail at this stage. And if so, we discard the solution, but if they're passed, we proceed to the evolutionary algorithm, which, which varies the positions. This is to find in this case, either it's not in our particular implementation, we just want to find um, an acceptably good uh, place. So you imagine I have some uh, line, which I didn't draw here, but suppose I want to find, uh, a, you know, a maximum 0 0.7 or better, which may or may not exist. So for us, it, we wouldn't necessarily need to maximize this because if we happen to hit a solution which is better than 0 0.7, we stop the algorithm. We say that's a good enough charge. Let's go to the next. Yeah. Function plus other uncertainty. Why you're 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 after a much smaller like you're after a volume. Yeah, yeah. So so um, you want? I can re rephrase the question. The the, 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 okay, the question was, why are we using this method, which appears to be like using a sledgehammer to crack a nut? Because this is a very powerful method, which in principle could uh, maximize Q1 and Q5 as functions of the prompt space. It's simply that um, for we're looking for an efficient method to get a high enough peak. So I, you know, I want a point bigger than uh, 0 0.7, which in this case I might have found, but um, actually getting that is not an easy task and these, these things are expensive. So it's much more efficient to use this than any kind of random grid search or, or something like that. It, it just happens to be that if you, if you try randomly to sprinkle fluxes within you know, the kind of ranges that we want, it's actually quite difficult to generate randomly examples of solutions with large charges. So it's, it's much more efficient than a random search is the short answer. Okay, it, it's hard to, I honestly, it's hard to believe from where, where I come from, but maybe, it, yeah, it, well, I, I'm sure, I'm sure. I can give you, uh, okay. in, Maybe in this specific case, it's right. It's just, it's a very, it's very counterintuitive if, you, if you've come from a data analysis point of view. Yeah. It's very counterintuitive to use this uh, for, it's, for what it's, you say. Um, it's basically coming down to the fact that the functions that we're trying to evaluate, this Q1, Q5, are some of various terms which are quad, you know, quadratic in these fluxes, which involve cancellations between positive and negative. So this function I'm actually maximizing has you know, lots of positive and negative uh, you know, regions, and it, it, it's not so easy, depending on the flux parameters you choose, to make it nice and large. We could, we could make it more easy for ourselves by choosing the flux parameters themselves to be large. But we didn't want to do that. Um, so within the parameters that we want to do for this implementation, it's useful to do this. Yeah. OK, so I'll, I said I would try to cut some time, so I will try to keep to that. Um, the short version of the next bunch of slides is that now we're going to use another fancy algorithm to modify the locations of the centers to get a more precise approximate solution. So the first step is that we're going to use the full inhomogeneous bubble equations, uh, holding fixed the flux parameters that we've got so far. Uh, and Unlike the first step where the variables were the flux parameters, now the, the second half of the algorithm, the variables are the positions. And the error is going to be quantified by the, the error in the bubble equations of which there are n minus 1. So we'll just sum the absolute values of the errors, and this will be the total error that we consider. Have you 
Yeah, we did that at an earlier. Yeah, we rounded off the b before we checked the uh, values of the charges. We rounded that was step four um, here that we rounded off the flux parameters before we computed the charges. Okay, so so now we have a solution, a, a, you know, a candidate configuration which is not a solution yet, but it does satisfy the quantization conditions and it has nice largest charges. Okay, so uh, in a nutshell, this evolutionary algorithm, uh, set of algorithms, is inspired by Darwin's theory of evolution and natural selection. So the starting point is a population, which is a set of individuals which are approximate solutions to the problem. So for us, each individual will be a candidate multi-center configuration, which is a near, almost solution to the Bobble equations, an approximate solution. Each individual has characteristics known as genes, which for us will be the coordinates of the centers plus some other parameters. And we'll quantify how fit an individual configuration is by the inverse of the total error. The fittest individuals are selected to reproduce combine our candidates in some particular way by passing the genes to the offspring. And in the process, some mutations are implemented so that we introduce some randomness into how we explore the solution space, the configuration space. And then as we generate new candidates, they replace some part of the population which die off such that the overall size of the population remains constant in the whole process of the algorithm. This then iterates until a sufficiently good solution is found or we reach some computational limits. And these algorithms tend to work well in situations in which incremental changes lead to incremental improvements. And so we expect that to be the case in this kind of uh, setup because we've already worked hard to get to a nearby good candidate solution. And we expect it to be possible to make small modifications to the senses of the locations uh, to get us a numerical solution. And these kind of algorithms have been used before in the context of string theory compactifications, but this is the first time they've been applied to multi-center solutions. So uh, for computational com 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 efficiency, we don't vary all the positions of the centers, but we fix some subset and we vary another subset. So we fix around one coordinate for each of around n minus three of the centers which gives us a good balance between effectiveness and computational cost. And we also introduce some multi-index which combines the label for the centers and the one for the three directions of the positions. Okay, so we just flatten the whole uh, data. And the, for each position for an individual, we have not just the position locations, but an additional parameter known as the strategy parameter this is used by the algorithm and you can think of it as encoding how confident we are in the position uh, that we have so far as our, our best candidate, the candidate for that uh, individual. So the genes are both positions and strategy parameters. So we first initialize a bunch of populations with just a random, uh, a pseudo random generation. So let's say we have a couple of thousand uh, candidates, approximate solutions, which is just Added, you know, adding Gaussian noise to the perturbation. And then, uh, okay, some details which I can skip. But at each process, we measure the fitness of the candidates and we select the fittest ones to reproduce in some particular way. This is selected probabilistically. So we <coughs> compare the fitness of each individual configuration to uh, the average fitness of everything else. And the, the probability to be selected to reproduce is proportional to the fitness of the individual. So then as the as two individuals uh, configurations are selected to reproduce, for each of the positions individually, we follow a probabilistic process, which either, either one parent passes their genes to the uh, descendant, or the other one does, or we take the average values of the two, plus some possible mutation. And so for the mutation process, we assign a probability such that on average, about two of the genes will uh, mutate away again with some random process uh, of adding a pseudo random uh, mutation to that, that parameter. Okay, the mutation is control. I gotta go quickly because these are just small details. We have another couple of Gaussian random variables, one for the individual. So what, one of these Gaussian random variables is selected once for each offspring, that's delta sigma. And the other is sampled separately for each gene. So this is um, just adding 
uncorrelated randomness to the mutation process. And okay, the magnitude are controlled by these strategy parameters. So this is how the strategy parameters are used by their algorithm. They set the magnitude of the random mutations. Okay, so there's one extra detail of the algorithm, which is that you would like to give the algorithm the help that if it's doing well, you want to enable it to allow finer exploration of the region it's exploring. But if it's not doing well, and if its candidates are fairly widely spread, you want to give it a random kick to just, you know, give it some help to go in a wider space. And this can be very useful, it doesn't always work, but it means that every several hundred generations of this algorithm, we reset all the strategy parameters. And you know, with exactly these two goals. So either allowed to do more fine exploration, or if it's stuck in some local minimum to try and escape. And so every few, you know, 700 generations or so, we reset all the strategy parameters according to the current variance of the population at that step. And uh, you know, that's just an extra detail, which enables the algorithm to either zoom in better or explore more widely. Okay. so. Oh, in view of time, let me pass to the uh, example I wanted to show you. So after we've run the Bayesian optimization, and in units where we've rescaled everything by 10 to the minus five to go into the scaling regime, then we have the following set of positions of the five centers. Here are my five centers, one, two, three, four, five. These are the X, Y, and Z positions of the centers. I've chosen coordinates such that one is at the origin, one is deviating only on the x-axis, and the other is only in the xy plane. And these are the given talking charges here, one, one, minus one, minus one, one. And these are the randomly generated flux parameters uh, in, in the order of tens. And after rounding, the, the flux parameters which were not fixed were solved for and then rounded off to be these values such that my charges were in the order of thousands. This was the thing we passed to the uh, evolutionary algorithm. And just to emphasize that there's no particular. These are, um, this is um, round, this is exact. There's no, um, it's, it's not that we did anything more precise and rounded it. It's just that we were operating from the start at four significant figures for the, um, Rounding means that when you um, solved the homogeneous bubble equations for these parameters which were not fixed here, then these parameters were irrational. So they went on, they were solved you know, analytically, but they're not rational a priori. So we just truncate them. We just round them off to some precision, which is a choice, and we chose to round to 10 to minus five. No, these are all, a priori dimension full, it's the ratios of the k's which have to be rational. They're all rational. I mean, so, so, th so these are now rational. So all flux parameters are rational. Yeah, so, so now I'm happy, we're happy with quantization at this stage, but we haven't solved the bubble equations yet. And uh, just to emphasize that there's no particular, uh, this lag is my, just to emphasize there's no particular symmetry other than my choice of axes, this is what the solutions look like plotted in R3. Okay, so the starting configuration has fitness of order one, which is pretty rubbish, but after about 12,000 generations, we get an approximate solution with fitness of order 10 to the 10, which means that each bubble equation is solved with an error no more than 10 to the minus 10 in magnitude. And now I have truncated to about seven decimal places the output of the algorithm for the adjusted positions, which if you go back and check, to the, you know, the first four digits haven't changed, but I've got more and more precision in where these locations want to be to actually solve the bubble equations with this precision. Okay, the CTC check is passed. The global charges are some numbers. And one thing you might ask me is, okay, how does the angular momentum of the configuration compare to the maximum for uh, a single center large black hole? 
And the answer is it's about 97% of the maximum allowed rotation for that black hole. And this is very consistent with the previously observed typical behavior of this type of configuration. What do I mean by this type? I mean, we chose given sorting charges, which were plus or minus one, and we have no special hierarchies between the positions. And yes, when Pierre commented in a couple of papers that the typical output for J left of this is like, in fact, slightly larger, like 99% of the maximum. Okay, here it's 97%, but it's very consistent with the kind of behavior that you get for these solutions. This gives us some confidence that we're reproducing generic features of, of previous uh, approaches. Yeah. There's a question here. Yeah. 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 Between the centers are sufficiently large, I would imagine that I don't need to find a multi-centered solution. I would just solve one center solution. It was just superpose, not in the quantum sense, but in the classical sense, uh, different centers. So can you comment about the distances between the centers that you found and whether we could have just superposed single center solutions? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. So, I mean, it's, we, well, you, you, that's not how... Suppose you ask. I mean, we don't build these solutions by making single center right. solutions and so I, I understand. But, but so suppose you have a star <laughs> and another star in one billion kilometer distance. You don't need to find its two center solution to construct them. You just find, you just write one center solution for the first one and the other. So I'm trying I mean, to ask if, if the same point holds in your case. Maybe I haven't emphasized clearly enough that, you know, the whole structure of these centers is is given by the bubbles between the centers and the fluxes between those bubbles and it's the interplay between those fluxes which generates both the bound state and the conserved charges so it's really a bound state yeah you shouldn't think of this as uh molecules that are, are flying. yeah okay we can discuss more later but, okay this is my last slide anyway uh so just before i conclude let me just mention we've done various runs for configurations of three five and seven centers and if you want to see a seven center version you can look in our paper and so to conclude, we've made the first construction of numerical multi-center solutions using evolutionary algorithms. It's a proof principle of the approach and there's lots of scope for further development. We can obviously put various different numbers of centers, different kinds of configurations. We can consider solutions that would be smooth in 60, but not five dimensions, for instance, super tube centers. So yes, from Pierre, I've thought about that as a way of reducing the angular momentum uh, away from this highly spinning regime. That would be very easy to implement. Um, it will be interesting to compare whether this approach is better or worse than other types of optimization algorithms. We haven't thought much about that. But also after Daniel's talk today, it got me thinking that maybe these solutions with less symmetry could be useful toy models for phenomenology because they may have less uh, distinct features than some of the more symmetric solutions which have been uh, studied to date. So uh, that's it, thank you. Is this also a way to generate lots of solutions by which you could then start thinking about statistics about what winds up with large amounts of spin or excluded regions in the moduli space? And yes, like that? absolutely. Yeah. So that, that, that's kind of implicit in my first, uh, the first thing is that really we can now sort of let the computer explore experimentally, if you like, the type of solution spaces to these you know, now familiar equations, but in a much more general Sense. So you know you, can, you make loads of these particular type of solutions. We would expect they would all be very highly spinning, but then if we change uh, you know the center from being smooth to having either high given sorting charge or being a super tube, we make it qualitatively different features. So I mean the, you guys have lots of uh, first-hand experience of that. So if there are any particular features you would like to bring out or see more of, we can certainly adapt the algorithm to explore those regions. I had a question actually. So the bubble equations have a moduli space. So when you have five centers, for example, there's a five-dimensional space of, of, of angles, which you know, with the same charges, with the same dipole charges and everything, you can still have solutions. Now, normally we put them on the line just to kill this moduli space, but then you know, we're not, now in your system, you have you know one guy off the line at some angle and some other angle. So in principle, there's a, at least a four-dimensional family of angles, uh, which are three parameters. Do you see how do you see these flat directions in your in your algorithm? That's a very good question. I 
think it wouldn't be easy to see in how we've implemented this so far. Mm -hmm. And that's because when we've chosen these positions, like I said, so, you know, this one, one sense is at the origin, one is shifted only on the x-axis, one is in the xy, these are just choice of coordinates and the rest is, is random. But the computer has found this by just experimentation of random numbers of positions. And so we haven't taught it to rotate or explore angles in any kind of systematic way, but I don't think- Can, 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 price, can I- can I, price, 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 it's equally, I mean, if you solve the bubble equations and the points are a bit over what the other point is off, mm -hmm. since you have a marginalized space, the genetic algorithm should be <laughs> arrives there, but there shouldn't be any price loss. Right, right, right. So yeah, we haven't we haven't seen that, but it, it could be interesting to look so, for. I know follow up, follow up on that. Have you stopped the algorithm from just running backwards and forwards along a modulus? Um, the, I mean, it, there's no special cut that we put on that behavior, um, but it, I guess that would be a feature that may come up if we really wanted to push it to very high precision. Um, it's more the fact that. Uh, you know, when we see the solution, when we see the candidate um, cutting off at some not particularly high fitness, we just discard the solution. For the, I didn't plot the, the fitness of this um, configuration, but what tends to happen in the, in the I'd say it quickly, what tends to happen is the fitness is getting better and better and better. We don't see flat things tailing off uh, in what we've done so far. Yeah. Okay, I think we'll have to cut things off there. We can continue the discussion during coffee, which will recoup some time. Let's make it 20 minutes. Yeah. And thank David again.